Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, you're joined here by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And as usual, we want to give a massive shout out to our incredible sponsors who help make the show happen. Seeds here now, your number one seed bank in the industry. A guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination, with all the hottest breeders and the latest drops. Why would you go anywhere else? If you finish a grow and you're not satisfied with the end product, hit them up. They'll make it right. They only stock the highest quality breeders. And I know they got some fire packs from your boy Heavy Days there. Check them out before they're gone, guys. Massive shout out to Seeds here now, your number one stop for all your genetic needs. But in order to get your garden pumping on all cylinders and producing the best crop to date, you got to make sure your room's dialed in. To do that, check out our friends at Pulse Sensors, number one sensors and integrated hubs in the game, measuring all of the variables, PPD, VPD, temperature, humidity, dew point, all the extra variables you don't consciously track to help ensure your next crop is the best to date. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation, Pulse Sensors are the number one in the game, and they've just recently released the Pulse Hub, a central unit to integrate all of their monitors to make sure that your rooms are the best they can possibly be. Massive thank you to Pulse Sensors. We appreciate you so much. Likewise, you've got to keep your garden pest and pathogen free, and to do that, you've got to check out our friends at Copit. These guys are the world leaders in sustainable biocontrol solutions for pests and disease. If you're battling spider mites, check out their new Spidex Vital Plus sachets. These are new Persimilis breeding sachets that release predator mites into your crop consistently over a period of several weeks, providing you with sustained spider mite control. Now you don't have to spread carrier material through your garden just to introduce predator mites. Just hang the sachets on your crop, let the Persimilis walk out and do the work for you. Trust me guys, you don't want to have to go up against a spider mite infestation without Spidex Vital Plus. These are truly the best predators in the game. I promise once you use it, you'll see the quality, you'll never go back. Massive shout out to Copet. Likewise, you got to check out our friends at Organics Alive. If you're growing organic and want to use high quality powdered organic fertilizers, you simply cannot go past Organics Alive. These guys truly walk the walk and talk the talk. They have been picking up cups left, right and centre with growers all around the country sweeping categories using their products. That is the ultimate testament in my opinion if home growers are winning competitions using their products. The proof is in the pudding guys. No matter what stage of the plant cycle you're at, veg, transition, flower, in need of micronutrients or a very specific sort of boost in late flower, they've got it. You've got to check out Organics Alive, guys. Truly one of the best in the industry. We're super stoked to be working with them because we know how amazing their products are. Used in heaps of breeder gardens that we have on the show. Again, check them out. Organics Alive, massive thank you. Massive shout out for supporting the show. Finally, a massive shout out to the entire crew at Dynavap. These guys make some of the best vaporizers on the game. I'm really passionate about this one because they help me to get off combustion and smoking bongs. If you have any concerns about your respiratory health, or heck, if you just want to try a different mode of ingestion, maybe try to get a better flavor hit, you've got to check out the Dynavat. These guys' units are cheap, they're incredibly well designed, and most importantly, they're very customizable. You can take your vape game to the next level, getting insane terps, all while retaining the potency you'd expect of a combustion or a bong. Truly, I was smoking bongs for over 10 years. I'm now vape only. Massive shout out to Dynavap. They're one of the best in the industry and we owe them a massive thank you. Shout out again, Dynavap. Massive thanks for supporting the show. Finally, a quick little mention to our Patreon gang, truly the lifeblood of the show. If you want to get early access to episodes, unheard and unreleased interviews, as well as going in the running to get amazing genetics each month and fortnight, come on, check out the Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. We do live smoke with heavy sessions every fortnight and give away heaps of swag every month. Come check it out. We love you, the Patreon gang. Thank you so much. We are so appreciative. And on today's episode, we are stoked to be joined by none other than the originator of the GMO, head breeder at Skunk House Genetics, a name you'd all be familiar with, creator of the Mike Larry, so much more, Skunk Master Flex, here to talk all things breeding. 
the journey he's been on thus far, the GMO, some plans for the future, and so much more. Without further delay, alrighty gang, a big thank you for joining us for another one. On our episode today, we are joined by the man behind Skunk House Seeds, a name you're all familiar with, the man who found the GMO, creator of Mike Larry, so much more. A big welcome to Skunk Master Flex for joining us on the show today. Hey, thanks for having me. Big welcome. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Tell me a little bit about what you're smoking on today. Um, always got some jars of some OG Kush. Um, always got some GMO. Always have my version of GMO, the the burger lines. Um, TKO, a uh, little bit of modified banana. Um, some Bubba Kush. <laughs> you know. A lot of the classics I like to keep around. Um, big Kush fan, big OG fan, so always have to have a good jar of it. You're making my mouth water. That was like an all-star lineup you just read off there. Before we jump into some of the more newer ones, I'd love to quickly touch on, you mentioned the Bubba. I feel like Bubba doesn't get as much of a mention as it used to. Are you a fan of it? I'm a huge fan of Bubba Kush. Um, really, really, really like the high from it. Really relaxing high. Uh, it's always been a favorite since the first day I smoked it. Um, it doesn't doesn't make its rounds anymore. People aren't really using it too much. You know, some of the older guys, I mean, I see a CSI and a couple of guys still working with Bubba Kush, but definitely not as popular as it was in the past. It's kind of upsetting, really. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the, the the main criticism I hear of Bubba is that it's a slow vegger. I guess the question is, do you think that's the predominant reason for the decline or do you think there's other sort of types of high that have replaced it? I think I think it's a little bit of everything, really, you know. Um, it is a slow vegger, but so is Urkel and so are a lot of other ones. Um, I think on a production standpoint, the prices of cannabis in the United States right now. I mean, I don't think people are doing it to scale, but I mean, on a personal garden, I always have a couple in there. Um, yeah, like I said, it's just, yeah, just not as popular. I think people are going for these new, de- you know, designer strings, these hybrids, um, sativas. I'm even seeing starting to pop up more than they were in the early 2000s, 2010s. So who knows where it's going to be a year from now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, you just quickly t- mentioned it, so I'd love to touch on it. Where do you sit on sativas versus indicas? Because I think if a lot of people looked at your catalog of work, they'd see a lot of indica work. Do you have a soft spot for sativas? Uh, I'm not a sativa guy. For just medicinal purposes myself, I'm a heavy indica smoker. Um, sativas give me anxiety sometimes, man. <laughs> um Bodhi gave me a cut of Temple Haze years ago, and it was like my first entry to like a full blown sativa that was like super racy. And I like drew it out, got all excited, um, rolled up the first joint of it and took like maybe a quarter of it down and like wanted to crawl out of my own skin. <laughs> it was just, it was just too much for me, you know, um, not my cup of tea. I do need to work with some though, because I do, you know, appreciate that people do like sativas, but, um, yeah, on a personal level, it's just, just not for me. Yeah. Wow. Look, I think, I think most people can relate to, uh, you know, indulging in some sativa and, uh, going a little too far, feeling a bit like yourself there. That's, that's really interesting to hear. I mean, out of curiosity, um, have you ever had any requests to breed with sativas? I feel like super silver haze is having a bit of a comeback. Do you ever get any requests to do any hybrids with things like that? Absolutely. Um, and super silver haze is a classic, man. Um, I had like this 45, 50 day pheno, um, like a decade ago that, uh, I use in some of my earlier stuff. Um, it just kind of got overshadowed by everything else, you know, but I do agree that sativas are kind of like, you know, hot right now. They're definitely coming back. Um, lots of people requesting it. I just haven't really, you know, dipped my toe into that sativa world really. And, uh, gotten to appreciate it because I don't, you know, for my personal use, I don't, I don't really touch it, but for other people, I mean, yeah, obviously as, as a breeder, you want to offer things in your catalog for everybody. So definitely some sustainable work coming down the line. 
Yeah, nice stuff. Cool to hear. I guess this might seem like a silly question to you, but I've actually heard a lot of people discuss this. Um, before we delve into, you know, the the rabbit hole that is the GMO, I'd love to just quickly ask as a preface, do you understand what people say when you maybe sometimes hear people say that they feel GMO is a sativa? Absolutely. Um, the thing about GMO that's tricky uh, that I think a lot of people caught in on is the amount of time taken to flower that plant to get it to completion where it's where it's actually fully matured. Um, if you take it early, it can get racy, you know, um, proper GMOs like close to 90 days. So, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, somebody maybe running on a commercial scale, maybe trying to stay in the nine week, 60, 63 day range. Um, I mean, I've, I've had racy batches that I've taken down early. Some people love it. For me, my sweet spot for the GMO is like 80 to 83 days. It's, it's a perfect balance. It's not too hard. I can still enjoy it. Um, it won't put me down to sleep, but I don't get any of that sativa out of it. But that's, you know, that's a personal thing. That's again, you know, I'm not a sativa really smoker. So that's where my sweet spot is. Yeah. Interesting. And I mean, what part of the genetics do you think it is that leads it to have that what most people would consider to be quite uh, like a longer flowering time than what you might expect from the parents on paper. Any idea where that might be coming from? There's like, you know, I've had this conversation with a lot of people over the years and there was mentions about maybe something got mixed up in the bag. Maybe it's not what it's, you know, it's not chem D crossed with forum cut. Maybe it's something else. Maybe there's, you know, maybe a seed, uh, seed stuck in the, bag that I got was was different. It's, you know, I mean, it was completely different than the rest of the fucking seeds that I popped out of that, that, um, bag of seed that I got, you know, it was the standout the entire time from sprouting the seed in a solo cup to, um, you know, transplanting it to everything like that, that plant grew, finished, looked completely different than everything else in that, in that group. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it might be something else, but you know, who's to say, you know, that whole chem lineage is so, you know, unknown really that maybe it's something in the back genetics, you know, a grandparent coming through, um, who knows, you know, so hard to call it, you know, I just kind of take it for what it is. And it's just a, just a really unique plant that I, I just really love to, you know, breed with and people seem to love to hash and just really, really, you know, epic is an epic find. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the concentrate potential and how maybe, um, you know, that doorway has opened up since finding the GMO, because I know for a lot of people, you know, GMO was a game changer for concentrates to them. How has it changed your perspective on it? I mean, I've had people walk up to me and say, the GMO made me a millionaire, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like, and it's like a, like a big group of people, like many people. Um, it's a hash monster, you know. It just dumps the type of trichome it produces. Um, it put you know it puts out that sandy type of you know trichome, and it just it as a breeding tool for you know making hash strains. It's just amazing, you know. Especially if you can if you can breed it where you can't really see its presence as much, but some of its attributes gets passed through. It's just, like I said, just, just an epic find. Yeah. Incredible. And I mean, like, I think one of the comments I've specifically heard a lot is that, you know, the, the terpene profile, it really translates to the end product of concentrates. And obviously, you know, not every strain does that as well as you'd like. What's your plans in terms of breeding concentrates going forward? Is it something you actively think about or is it just a peripheral thing? And it's like, well, if the genetics facilitate a good plant, then like, you know, cool. I mean, these days you have to basically breed for part of the intent to be concentrates. Um, The concentrate market is just so big between, you know, people making these um, rosin and resin pens. Um, Just the demand for hashers is so big that to breed and not take that consideration would be a major mistake, in my opinion. Um, Luckily, the majority, the bulk of the work that I do has 
you know, small amounts at least of GMO in the lineage. So um, any cross, really, if you really do a proper hunt, you can come across something, you know, that'll just dump. That's, that's awesome and, you know, amazing and unique. Um, the GMO does tend to be dominant in, in genetic crosses. Um, so I found like, if you kind of like knock it down to where it's like 25% of the pedigree, um, you can really start finding some amazing things that don't get dominated by it, but just offer, you know, their own, you know, unique twists that are just, you know, amazing and yield and, and, and dump and just taste great and have unique turf profiles. Um, it's a lot of the work that I do, you know, it's, it is for hash. So luckily the GMO kind of definitely assists in that department. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. Look, I think we may as well jump into the discussion now because we've already we've already basically started it. But I just wanted to ask one like one last quick question, which is, I um I I got given a bud of a GMO from Adam Dunn last year at one of the events, and I have to be honest, it was it was so putrid smelling in a good way. I was like, I don't know if I can smoke this. Have you ever had any experiences like that where it was like a little too gnarly, and you're like, this is this is full on. Yeah. It's like, so when, when I first started doing, uh, productions of it, you know, obviously this is, um, pre-medical, um, at least, you know, we weren't doing medical grows. It was just, uh, you know, kind of a black market grow. Um, we would have to move a bunch of the, you know, pounds and go from city to city. And it was just so gnarly smelling, you know, um, my buddy that was helping me, you know, move a bunch of it. He had this, uh, this two door Cadillac. And, uh, we always threw a bunch in the, in the trunk and drove to Ann Arbor, which was the first place that we were kind of doing drops at, um, tree city. And, uh, we moved so much weight in that trunk that it, it permanently stained his car. <laughs> it just, it, the smell never came out. They had to, you know, they had to send it out to, I think it was like Dubai or something like that, or Lebanon or some, some other country just to, just to get rid of it. it you know, anybody that sat in the thing in the used car lot, was like man this thing smells terrible like it smells like weed they just couldn't get the smell out of it so i mean it definitely has a staining attribute to it and it's putrid and and some people love it and some people just absolutely hate it (laughs) (laughs) which you know i get you know you know everybody has their own you know preferred flavors for cannabis but um it's it's almost unbearable to some people and i find that kind of fascinating and hilarious at the same time you know like it's just from the first batches of it it was just like i said like it was a standout it was unique lots of opinions on it you know like you said you know you got got a bud and it was just like so almost so almost so offensive that you didn't want to smoke it like i think that's i don't know i find that to be funny <laughs> <laughs> definitely and i mean another sort of comment slash observation i'd heard is that you know, GMO really illustrates the point that, you know, with just, I, I guess I'll have to sort of paint in broad swathes here, but like a lot of males in the industry are really attracted to the most acrid, offensive, off-putting sort of smells you get. And GMO really highlights that. And then, you know, you, you find that some of the females are really not that interested in that sort of smell, you know. Have you ever noticed this yourself, that it's like it's like a bit grotesque and some some people are just inherently really into it and others are, are just like not? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I now that you kind of, you know, mention it, it's, it is kind of um, guys definitely tend to draw themselves toward the, the they want the funkiest weed, you know. <laughs> the uh the um females that i smoke with or, or have in the past typically tend to like fruity genetics things that aren't as offensive um you know like the urkels and, and, and stuff like that um obviously not exclusively but like you said it's it's definitely guys like stank weed <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally totally and look i'll uh i'll put it out there i'm i'm a fruity guy myself so what does that say about me i don't know okay <laughs> okay. Uh, okay a little feminine in there no yeah. <laughs> no i like i like fruity i like fruity too man i just i like if i have my fruit in there i have to have some gas to it you know something that kind of like makes it not just fruit yeah. um you know but i you know i i like to get some uh purple punch every once in a while and you know just something that tastes good that doesn't necessarily like get you fucking annihilated but like it's just enjoyable smoke good flavor 
Yeah, totally, totally. All right. Well, let's let's dive into it. Tell me a little bit about the genesis of the GMO in the sense of what was it that drew you to those seeds and how did you get them? You know, did you have a friendship with Mimiko? Did you just happen to find yourself with those seeds? How did it all go down initially? So initially, Mimiko was not even mentioned at all in it. Um, you got to go back. This is like 2012, 2011, 2012. THC Farmer. Uh, I'm a moderator on there or was a moderator on there um, along with, you know, Cap and all those guys. Um, Divine Genetics was ran by Logic, who was the owner of THC Farmer. Um, Not sure if you're familiar or not. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Lots of, lots of bad, a couple good, lots of bad though. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, He had a bunch of seed that he wanted tested. Um, so I, you know, I threw my hat in the ring and said, sure, you know, I'll, I'll run some seed. I'll see, I'll see what it's about. You know, um, Chem D Crosswood Girl Scout Cookie Forum Cut, uh, was one of the crosses that uh, landed in my lap, which, um, didn't really actually get named until like, you know, probably years down the road, um, did the Fino hunt, didn't know that he was white labeling the genetics um not until years later um like years and year, probably almost five years later did we find out that Namiko made uh the seed so i mean as soon as he as soon as that we think you know a lot of us figured it out we definitely got credit for it um but logic was kind of keeping that like tucked away he wasn't really letting anybody know about it so uh it was kind of news you know to our ears but yeah man um the seeds wound up because they were they were tester seeds. Wow. Okay. So you you really got them truly early on in the picture, I guess. Yes, sir. Like like you said, I think I believe it was like 2012 was when I got them. Fino hunted them right away. Uh, Fino hunted all the seeds that he gave me, and then over the years uh, ran into other people that wound up buying the seeds after they had been released, um, and they they shot me the seeds that they had left. And everybody was convinced that just, you know, it's whatever was going to get tapped out of there was tapped out of there in the GMO. And there was a couple others, um, honorable mentions that I found in the seed stock. Um, But the GMO was definitely the standout. Um, There was a root beer pheno. My buddy used to say it smelled like root beer. It was was like a stout plant, completely different. Um, There was a bunch of weird stuff that popped up in there, but you know, like I said, nothing, nothing that was anything close to GMO. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting. As a quick little digression, have you ever spoke to Mean Gene about that? Because it's almost coincidental that he's done some pairings with his root beer and the GMO. I thought maybe, maybe you'd spoke about that with him and he thought, oh, I'll pair them together. No, big fan of his though. Um, love his work. Don't know him personally. I haven't really had much interaction with him, but yeah, I saw that uh, GMO cross with his root beer bx1 or, or whatever it was that he was working um love to try those seeds haven't had the chance but yeah it's, i saw it and was very interested very intrigued in what he was doing with that line wow that's some synchronous stuff right there that you know you sort of got a pheno like that and he's sort of paired them together that's cool okay well if we loop back to the story i guess the question is you mentioned a little earlier that you know even during that first run you flowered him out you could tell this was something a bit different to the rest the question is did you like you know you've acknowledged you realized it was different did you realize like how special it was and i guess let's say when you had the first or second batch of flour from it What was like the public slash your friends' responses? Did they realize what it was or did it take some time to catch on? So that that pheno hunt actually went down in the basement of the house I lived in at the time and, uh, you know, used a couple carbon filters, but that thing was like a carbon filter destroyer. (laughs) (laughs) That one plant that that I had the first, during the pheno hunt, I mean, I had buddies that came over the house and, you know, were like, dude, your house, like, stinks man like it's <laughs> it's worse than it usually is you know like what what do you got going on down there like you got something different like what, what's up let me see what you got you know so I, I showed i showed it off a little bit in the in the testing phases and everybody said the same thing they were just like look at the stack on that thing it's throwing out like baseball bats you know like never seen anything like it before um it was just a unique plant like from day one you know it's just so vigorous and it just 
it stood out always. And um, we didn't really find out how well of a hasher it really even was until um, I did, you know, larger rooms and we kind of like started processing it like by itself. And the numbers that we were getting back, were just like, holy cow, like, the hell is going on here? This thing is incredible. Like, these numbers are nothing like what we're, you know, anything else we're running. Yeah. Wow. Just a game changer. So I guess the question then becomes, was it like a linear progression? Did Was it like everyone you showed it to was interested in and it was just building in popularity or did it take a little bit of time for it to really start to spread like wildfire? Because at a certain point, it obviously hit critical mass and just exploded. And I'm just wondering, when was that? So, Fino hunted, kind of started to scale it up a little bit, realized it was something special and it could yield and, and we could use it for hash making. Um the name itself was kind of a big deal in the beginning. Um, the first places, like I said, Street City and Ann Arbor, Michigan here, that we would drop it at, uh, when we first dropped it, it didn't move. It sat on the shelf. Huh. Nobody, you know, no, a lot of people didn't want to touch it. It's kind of a, kind of a vegan area, kind of a hippie area, you know, mm. and uh, the name was a turnoff for them. So the owner said, uh, you know, look, would you be offended if I changed the name of this? And I said, no, absolutely not. Like, you know, if, if it's, uh, you know, not going to move, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, get you burnt here. Um, so he said, what do you think about, you know, everyone says it smells like garlic. What do you think about calling it uh, garlic cookies? And I said, you know, should give it a try. So he did the name change and then it just couldn't stay on the shelf. It just flew. So the demand grew. So we had to produce more and then it just kind of like was a snowball effect. It just became, you know, a huge favorite in the area amongst everybody that tried it. And just, it just really started to explode at that point. Um, we just couldn't even keep up with demand. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, you touched on a, a point that comes up in almost every website. If you Google GMO, which is, you know, as you mentioned the name, you know, what what did the name originally mean to you and what does it mean now if that's changed at all so gmo to me was just like referring to it's like how just wild it grew just like how how strong it was you know like it grew at three times the speed in veg that anything else did that i had in the rooms and just how it threw out these huge baseball bats you know i'm like this thing's got to be like you know genetically modified um so I started kind of giving it the nickname GMO, you know, it's like joking around, it's like this thing is, you know, kind of a, a force of its own. Um, also, coincidentally, at the time, the Girl Scout uh, cookies were getting like, you know, a bunch of press in the news for putting GMOs um, in their in their baked goods and stuff. So it was just kind of like, I don't know, the universe telling me to just call it GMO, um, which is actually kind of ironic because... Um, it, logic was completely against and like forbid me to call it GMO. And then <laughs> years down the road, put out GMO seeds, which is just, I don't know, I find comical. <laughs> yeah, it made him backflip on it. I love that. I love that. And I mean, I guess as a, how would you phrase it? A question that people are probably wondering, and I certainly am, is, you know, given the dominant ChemD profile within the GMO, what's your thoughts on the ChemD and the chem dogs in general? I love the chems. I think the chems are amazing. I mean, I like them on a personal level to smoke. I like them to use in genetic breeding. I like them to just grow for flower. Um, I think the ChemD is amazing. Um, probably my favorite chem at least to grow. I do like the Chem 91, but the whole Chem line itself, man, is just, it's so strong. It's so, you know, epic in, in genetic crosses. It's just to, to not like Chem would be insane to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, certainly, certainly. And I mean, I, I was probably meant to slot this in just the prior question, but just to 100% rule it out, what's your thoughts on when people say that GMO stands for garlic, mushroom, onion? Do you think like, oh, it's just a funny coincidence and it sort of works out? Or is it just like, no, nah, it's definitely not anything related to it? I think it's just funny coincidence and kind of works out. I mean, some people get garlic smell in there. Some people get onion smell in there. To me, it just kind of smells skunky, you know? Um, 
definitely not what I intentionally, you know, put the GMO, you know, out there for as an acronym. But um, I think it's cool hearing the stories of people kind of like going in their own direction with it. And it's probably one of the most asked questions I ever get is just, you know, did the GMO, you know, stand for this or me and my buddies are having a debate and, you know, I bet them that it stood for this or that. And I don't know, it's, it's fun. You know, I, I have a good time with it. You know, the cannabis community reaching out and kind of trying to get the the lore of the backstories of everything. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's cool. I enjoy it. People can call it whatever they want, but to me, it's, it's always just going to be GMO and it's just based on how it grows and, you know, my experience with it. But Yeah, that's beautiful. So, I mean, we, we've sort of touched on this, but I just wanted to delve into the topic a little more. You know, you referenced earlier, maybe there was some pollen contamination or something like that. But I guess my question is, to me, the GMO seems like a lottery ticket phenotype in the sense that, you know, as you've said, many people have popped those seeds and no one's really found anything that similar. I guess the question is, do you feel that it's like, in my mind, I guess maybe an analogy is, I feel like it's kind of similar to the Mac one, you know, it's like, it's this insane cut and no one's really been able to find anything that stands up to it while hunting those same seeds. Is that how you think about it? Or do you lean more towards the possibility of pollen contamination as opposed to like, this is just the one pheno where we really lucked out? I mean, I think in my opinion, I think it's just something in the back genetics that came out and popped out um, for one random seed to pop in there and just kind of like be that much of a game changer would just be, I guess, to me, it, it just not as, not as possible. Um, everything to me just leans toward just the chem is just awesome. <laughs> and uh, just, it was just a freak pheno that came out and, you know, kind of made its way and just, it was meant to be kind of thing, you know, um, mm. our group kind of held it in our, our little circle for a while, but we just felt like really the world needed to really enjoy it, you know, get out there and, uh, make some people's gardens happy. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome to hear. Have you ever made or ran any S ones from it and found anything interesting in there? So the issue with the GMO, when you start doing S1s and reversing it is obviously uh, hermaphrodite fucking, you know, tendencies. It wants to throw pollen and the lowers from seed doesn't necessarily stay in the traits. Kind of like I've, I've done some S1s and um, I've cloned them before I ran the seed and didn't run the straight seed and I didn't have the issues. But like, you know, as a breeder, you can't rely on people to do that. So I've always kind of like steered away from putting out S1s and doing a lot of fem work in general um not that fems are always going to be you know herm issues but something about that particular strain um i've just had issues with it with fem seeds not so much being the pollen um receiver but being the donor ah okay and so i guess the flip side of that question is what sort of genetics do you think the gmo pairs well with I like to put it with stuff that kind of, you know, stays shorter, stays a little squatter. No, I mean, I love OG Kush and pairing it with OG when I, when I did the Han Solo burger, um, was just amazing, you know, but I'm a big gas fan and I like that kind of stuff. Um, but I did some, I did some work. I did some Urkel crosses with it. Um, I did an Obama Kush cross, um, with the BX, the Donnie burger, which is a GMO BX one. Um, some of those phenos came out just incredible. Um, you know, I like to pair it with stuff that it's kind of like opposite of. You know, it already has that funkiness. It already has that that wild stretch. So to pair it with something that's, you know, kind of fruity or kind of more stout and, you know, has attributes that kind of like mellow it out with the stretch and, and everything, I, I found to be the most beneficial. Yeah, sure. And I guess... An extension of that is what sort of traits are you looking to improve? So I guess if you had to, you know, be critical, what do you think could be better? So, I mean, everybody's, everyone's complaint with the GMO is it takes too long to flower, um, which I agree with, you know, it does, it does take a long time. So it kind of negates the commercial standpoint of it, though you can run it commercially. It's just most people nowadays, because of how the industry is, they want to run like nine weeks and, Proper GMO just can't go nine weeks. Um, 
So when you, when you breed with it or use it as a tool, your main, at least my main goal is to shorten flower times, uh, which I've, you know, I've, I've been able to do um, and still be able to pull a lot of that funk, a lot of those things that people love about the GMO. It just, people just don't have the patience to run 90 days, 85 days. So definitely the time got to knock that down. The stretch, some people have an issue with it that have shorter ceilings or more confined space. So knocking that stretch down a little bit is is always something that I, I look to accomplish when breeding with it. Um, I like to kind of like dense it up. Don't really like to give it things that have foxtail tendencies. Um, the GMO can kind of foxtail sometimes on its own. So anything that can kind of like help densen it up. So basically flower time, flower density, stretch. Those are like the main, my main concerns whenever I use it as a tool for breeding. Yeah, nice. And I'm really keen to jump into some of the Donnie Burger, Han Solo Burger, all that sort of stuff. But before we get there, I just want to quickly ask you, I read an interesting comment by a good friend of the show, Dyer Wolf. He's a well-known Canadian grower and he made a comment a few weeks ago that sort of stuck with me, which was, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially he said, you know, GMO has done more for the Canadian cannabis scene than any other strain since Breeder Steve's Sweet Skunk, which obviously, you know, made a big splash many years ago. Have you heard sentiments to this effect and how does it feel to be associated with a strain that's has such far reaching impacts in a, you know, a place like Canada, which is, you know, well-known cannabis producer. Uh, I think it's amazing. <clears throat> I think it's amazing that I was able to be part of that and just, you know, I didn't, I didn't breed it. I just selected, it. I just found it. I'm just the, the person that bought the lottery ticket that, you know, hit a jackpot, so to speak, but um, being a part of that and being able to share that and, and hearing people's stories about how it's changed the industry in such a positive way, especially, like I said, you know, these, these guys that are big hashers and, and make a lot of rosin and, you know, all these concentrates and just hearing their stories about just how it's changed their lives financially. And just like, personally, it's just, it's amazing. I'm so proud and happy to be a part of that and just be part of the story, you know, just to be somebody that contributed to it. It's just fills me with joy. Uh, humble man. I love it. I love it. All righty. Well, let's jump in to some more breeding stuff. But before that, take me back. Tell me about your first experience with cannabis. Um, started smoking at a young age. Um, the first time I smoked, I knew that it was going to be something important in my life. Um, it just like had this hold on me where it was really calming and it just went along with a certain type of lifestyle that I knew I wanted to be a part of. And I just, just haven't really put it down um, since, you know, except for a short little period with, uh, <laughs> with the court system. But <laughs> besides that, it's just been a, been a constant in my life, man. And, you know, I've, I've, feel like it's just changed me for the better yeah wow that's awesome to hear that you had that connection with it so early on when you first started smoking was this at a time frame when like there were stray names or was it before that and do you remember the sort of effects you were feeling when you were first starting smoking so like i'm decently old not super old in the community the majority of the peers like you know all the breeders and stuff i'm i'm in my late 30s so the peak, I guess, when I started was like 99, you know, um, we weren't really getting genetics that had like full on names. They would come around every once in a while, but the area that I'm at wasn't really like a cannabis capital here in Michigan. Um, we would get stuff like Northern Lights every once in a while from like older smokers, some skunk. Skunk was really big in Michigan here, um, if you could get your hands on it, but couple years maybe into smoking we started to see um some of my buddies like older brothers and stuff started doing little closet grows and would go to like amsterdam and bring back seed and some of the some of the early sensi stuff and and serious seed stuff like ak-47 and 
um, Sensi Star. I remember being just like amazing, where it was just like once you got your hands on that, like you're like I'm not I'm not smoking this, uh, you know, off brand whatever it is. Like this is this is all I want now. This is it's a game changer. It's just you know unique and the highs are different and they're exciting and yeah, just early on, you know, it's just, they, we didn't have what people have now with this variety and the accessibility, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you can probably somewhat relate to that. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how available genetics are there in Australia, but, um, you know, it's, it's to grow up in an era where you had to seek really good weed and it wasn't always available. And then to have what we have now here, where you can just walk into a store and pick off of a menu, it's just, how times have changed. <laughs> yeah, hugely, hugely. I mean, yeah, paradigm shift for sure. So I guess then I'm interested to know what was the progression from, you know, having the first few encounters with it, realizing this is something you're highly into to then progressing to your first grow. Do you remember that and what you were growing? Absolutely. So I went to Jamaica on a trip and got to tour some really cool ganja fields out there um found some seeds and some buds uh brought them back horrifyingly brought them back and <laughs> uh built this little box um and just did my first grow with a 400 light bulb and it was just like i, I didn't even think about it it just came naturally or it was just like you know, nothing that anybody I knew was doing at the time. No one was, no one was growing any flowers. I was, you know, 18 years old and it was just something that people weren't really talking about. There wasn't even like grow supply stores you could walk into and just openly talk like you can now. Um, so it was like, you know, it was kind of difficult. It was, you know, I'd, internet wasn't even something that, you know, people were really much using at the time. It was, you know, just starting to get where, you know, forums were, you know, getting formed and, and people were talking about it openly, like on the internet. It was, it was a lot more difficult to start back then. Um, but it was, the progression was, was constant. It was just a flow. It's just something that naturally I wanted to get involved in and, and seek out other people that were doing the same thing, like-minded people and kind of led me to like, I see mag and, and, you know, THC farmer and stuff like that. Um, where I could just interact with other people that were going through the same stuff and were, could relate to what I was trying to accomplish and give me ideas and we could just kind of like feed off of each other. And it was, it was a unique thing to experience, um, growing flower when nobody else in the area did, you know, now it's, you know, everybody's involved some way in either cultivation or cannabis and, it just wasn't the case back then. Yeah, totally. Everyone's a cannabis consultant these days, aren't they? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> tell me, what was the first plant you grew where like it was like a standout? You know, I remember the I remember when I first started growing, you know, a lot of the plants were pretty midsy and it was mostly because of my skill. But I do remember a plant, you know, tolerating my my horrible growth styles and still producing a nice sort of crop. And you're like, Oh, some plants produce really good, bud. What was that yeah. moment like for you? I started growing with this group of guys in Detroit. Um, they were doing warehouse grows. Um, they had already developed their own kind of tech. I went along with, um, they were growing this strain that we just called the perp. It wasn't the same as the seed bank perps. It was, what I was told years later was something called green cross or something, which is kind of, you know, hilarious considering it was pure purple, but, um, they were doing like one gallon pots, like 40 of them per four by four, just packed side by side growing like single colas. And I knew if I had gotten my hands on it, that I could kind of develop a better method and grow it more efficiently and better. And I did not that it was like, you know, a game changer, but, um, you know, just doing a scrog of just one gallons was just not, not the method, but that was my first like obtained clone. That was like something special that I could do, you know, 
different types of grows with and, and kind of like document it and kind of figure it out and play with it. And, you know, screen grows and, and you know, DWC grows and when, you know, hydroponics and all that stuff, you know, first kind of like I got introduced to that. It was unique seeing the differences, but I wanted being a soil grower and stayed with organic soil for, for a lot of years. And, um, that's pretty much where I stayed for a long time until I switched over to cocoa and I didn't switch over to cocoa until like, I don't even know, maybe, maybe four years ago or five years ago. But yeah, that, that one, per that one purple strain was definitely, um, the one early on that kind of changed the game for me, uh, opened some doors. Yeah, incredible, incredible. Okay. And do you remember in those early years, I think a lot of people, you know, we end up getting these seed addictions and we end up buying lots and lots of seeds. What sort of stuff were you buying? Oh, man, I was buying everything. <laughs> <laughs> seeds were like my, I don't even know, they were like my drug. <laughs> I would just, anytime that seed drops would happen and I was following them, I just, I had to, I, I still to this day have seeds that I bought like, you know, 15 plus years ago that are just sitting in the refrigerator that I just never did anything with. It was just like a, it was like a habit, you know, it's like, gotta have these seeds. These are, these are going to be the, these are going to be the great ones. And, you know, <laughs> some of them we touched and got into, and some of them are still sitting there just waiting to be messed with. I like to go down a memory lane every once in a while and open up the fridge and go through all the containers of seeds that I have. And but I was I was buying up, you know, in the earlier days, I was getting a bunch of like sensi seed stuff and, you know, uh serious seeds, flying Dutchman, you know, I was getting stuff over from like Europe. And then um once the forum days kind of started, you know, these this OG Kush kind of wave started and you were just looking for things that had like OG Kush in them or, you know, Bubba Kush in them or any of the chems, if you're lucky enough to get anything with chem in it, and, you know, um, which is the whole just buying seeds in bulk thing was just kind of like why I started making my own seeds. Cause it was just, I, I was finding not great representation of what I was really looking for in seed form. So it kind of like mentally put me in this position where I'm like, you know, I need to, I need to start doing some creating. I need to you know get my, get my hand in some of this genetic stuff and uh, kind of changed, you know, me buying seed to trading seed and kind of things kind of went in a, you know, different directions from there. Yeah. So tell me about it. What was your first endeavor with breeding? I was playing around with male plants, kind of trying to, you know, understand, you know, how drop and pollen and, and what kind of traits, you know, plants, put out or gave and, and, you know, looking for indicators, stem rub and, you know, stressing out plants to kind of play with them, see what it made it do and, you know, starve them out or don't give them water for a little while and kind of drought them out and see what kind of expressions come out with them. See if they, you know, make some drop pollen. And, you know, it's my whole thing, my whole breeding experience is all, it's all based on trial and error. You know, I'll make things and, and they'll be awesome and I'll make things and they're fucking terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's like it's all just like a constant learning experience for me and it's a you know there's a big learning curve to the whole breeding thing and, and just growing in general and i don't think you can grow unless you have failure and just breeding even more so like like i've been work i worked a larry line still working the same larry line um for like 10 plus years and i had certain generations that i you know made and and went back because I wasn't, I wasn't happy with how, you know, the offspring was. So, I mean, even to this day, I still make plenty of error, like constant error, but, you know, I pride myself in, you know, when I have success in it and, you know, it's, it would be naive to think that everything that is ever made is, is going to be, you know, awesome. Yeah, sure. Look, you touched on the, the Larry and that was certainly something I was hoping for us to delve into. You know, I wanted to first off start by asking, where did the passion for the Larry OG come from? Well, a lot of the passion came from it being the only OG I could get my hands on. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of wanted to be in the leading horse there in the uh, in the race. But um, luckily, I mean, the Larry is epic. Like it's, it's a great OG Kush. Like, I wish I still had the original cut of Larry. I'd be thrilled to have the original Larry. Um, pretty much worked it into a solid seed and 
something like basically spot on or close to pops up on a regular basis for me. But it was definitely like, you know, it was my first dealings with OG Kush, the first genetic that I got in physical form of, of a clone of OG Kush. And I just love the plant so much. And, you know, I was lucky enough to get it and have a real version of it. And it kind of just like made it a no brainer for me, like that it was going to be something that I worked with. And uh, early on in the game, I was blessed enough to um, kind of get to know uh, Elite Genetics. And he was also a big Larry fan. Um, he had worked uh, something that he was calling the Lemon Larry, which was Larry OG Kush crossed with Sour Diesel IBL from um, Res Seeds. Uh, he passed me some of the seeds uh, to work with. Uh, so I was able to do like a little BX across the uh, mail that I found from his seed stack to the Larry clone only, um, making the first BX. And then uh, I just worked, you know, F gens from that point on and, and you know, finished up F10s. And, you know, I'm still going to continue to work the line until, I don't know, just probably forever. It's just such a great line. It's, it's amazing. Um, the, the outcrosses that I've made from it, people have loved. It's just, uh, it's something that's special to me as a breeder. It's just, I put a lot of time and work into it. So, um, I'll probably always continue aligned to that. Ah, that, that's awesome to hear. And I, I read on your website that you'd sort of, um, you know, briefly discuss this experience where you got to try this legendary OG while you're on Venice beach. Do you think that was the Larry? I think that was probably just the original OG, um, grown really well by somebody there in Southern California. Um, I've grown the original just briefly. Um, I just, I just got it back from Josh. Um, him and I are actually uh, working on a collab project together, uh, an OG project. Um, so it should be cool to see how, the original, which I think is what they were calling the Venice OG, um, grown locally in the area of Venice at the time, um, how that grows and in, in contrast to, you know, being hit with the Larry that I've worked on for so long and seeing what kind of expressions come out of that, uh, what kind of phenos I can find and, and just kind of lines that we can work together from all that. It's, you know, something I'm really, really, really excited about. That's awesome to hear. And uh, yeah, definitely shout out Josh D, just a, a lovely guy. Shout out Josh D, man. Josh is the man. Yeah, I, I've met him two or three times in person when I've been in the States, and he's always been such a lovely, you know, just really easy to talk to guy. So definitely shout out Josh D. I've got a question that's more of a personal one for me than anything else, but years ago, probably at least 10 years ago, I tried some Larry OG that was imported bud from the States, you know, came to Australia. And I remember thinking, you know, it had this sour lemon sort of flavor to it. And then years later, I tried Larry OG at Mr. Bob Hempel's house and it was like the original OG. And I was like, oh, this isn't lemony like the one I tried years ago. And then, you know, as you've sort of touched on, you hear that there's this other one, you know, this electric lemon Larry, it's got a few different names. Do you think that, that that is the explanation for the experience I had? I probably just tried the Electric Lemon and the original Larry OG is more like the original OG where it's like an earthy, cushy, like not really a lemon thing or any explanation for maybe how I had those two different experiences? Yeah, I mean, I've gone back and forth with a few people on this and the original is just a lot, a lot more rare than people would think it is. There's a lot of... Um, seed genetics that have been created i know swerve did um did a larry uh bx2 or something um years back and some of those phenos that people found were getting passed as the larry um i know that some of elites from elite genetics i know that some of his seeds that he made of the lemon larry were getting tossed around is just larry clone only um, so most likely, I mean, if my opinion, it would probably be one of those type of situations where if you got something that was truly like lemony, then it was probably like had some, some of that sour diesel or something in it, you know, that gave it kind of that twist. It does, it does have like a little bit of a, a more citrus than, you know, the original, but it still has that classic OG to it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not like candy coated 
type of thing. It's more like a mouth coating cush that has like that little slight, like electrified kind of, you know, little lemon to it. It's very, very light though. It's, it's not like the lemon Larry or the one that swerved in, but there was, and I know, cause I've, I've gotten past a couple Larry's that I've grown out and was like, you know, this isn't the original one. This is, uh, one of the ones from seed. Um, so I think there's a lot of that going on or was going on there for a period of time. Uh, I don't really see the Larry pop up at all anymore. Um, there's been a couple people I've talked to recently that have been like, I don't know, you know, wild witch hunt for this alleged, you know, real Larry. And I don't know, I've, I've, I haven't been able to, you know, track it down myself and grow it and, and get a, get a real version of it. So it's out there somewhere. Somebody has it, but probably the difference that you're seeing is that the one later on down the road that you tried out, that was more like the original, that was probably the real Larry. And the ones from the earlier days were, were crosses is what I would probably best uh, guess on that. Yeah. Okay, cool. That, that certainly makes sense in my mind. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your Larry OG line and some of the specifics about it, because we did have some fan submitted questions. And I guess one of the obvious things that jumps out to most people is that you've bred it a number of filial generations. I think, as you mentioned, up to the F10 the question is, what sort of traits were you looking to preserve and what so, how would you describe the plants that you'd get from that line in general, the, the seed line as opposed to the clone? So what I was really trying to do is just kind of capture the original into seed form. Um, I wasn't really trying to necessarily in the beginning um, add anything to it or strengthen it in any ways. Um, I guess maybe like subconsciously I would select you know, plants by structure that had better node spacing than the original. The original kind of, is, you know, has a little bit of lengthiness to it. Um, maybe I was doing a little bit of that subconsciously, but it was really trying to just lock down the original and, um, you know, just in case down the road, I kind of lost it, which, you know, it's exactly what happens. Um, I could kind of like pop seed and just kind of, you know, start over again, you know. Um, definitely think that some of the generations that I ran through some of the sour popped up in and I would get phenos that ranged almost on the diesel side. Um, the F sixes that I made, I got a lot of sour in them and even some like purpling that came in, which was kind of different than some of the other generations. But, um, the F sevens were the ones that I started doing out crossbreeding with. The F8s were more public ones that I did drops with. Um, it's like I said, it's probably really just like the goal was to get that and just lock it in in seed form. Yeah. And, and would you say that in general, you feel like you've been able to do that? Or do you feel like each generation sort of represents the clone in a slightly different way? Um, I think I've been able to do it for the most part. I mean, there's there's certain generations that I, I favor just cause I like, you know, how they are. But, um, the last ones, the last two, the, the F eights were pretty locked in. There wasn't a whole lot of variation really at all. Um, there wasn't any sours that came up. The F nines were just like amazing. They were, you know, straight OG Kush, like every plant looked very similar. There was no, you know, massive nug phenos or no sour phenos or nothing weird that was popping up. It was, you know, it was really uniform where, you know, as it should be, you know, uh, that far work down the line. Um, but it's surprising even when you inbreed some stuff that far, like, you know, you get some things that pop up every once in a while, especially if you're popping enough seed and, and, and looking through things properly, you know, some of the back genetics that'll come up in it. And it's just, I mean, at this point, it's just keeping the gene alive and kind of preserving it. It's just for fun. It's not like, you know, I'm trying to accomplish anything more at this point with it, but um, the outcrosses are really what, what really excite me about that Larry line and um, look forward to kind of like what that can mix with the whole Josh collab and 
you know, it's just uh, an honor to be a part of the OG Kush thing and trying to make my way with that, like like I did with the GMO, you know. Yeah, nice. And I mean, you just sort of touched on it there. What was the first outcross you did with it that really got you excited? Um, I had did a Chem Four uh, cross with Larry OG, and that was just like so unique. And it drew like different types of chems in the phenos that were like ranging from just huge flowering um, plants, just covered in resin to just gas and just, it it was just amazing. The chems and the OGs mesh very well together. um, In my experience, they have. Um, I did some other OG, I did the TK I used the TK and crossed it with the Larry, um, the Louie, a lot of the OGs that were around. Um, I just thought, you know, like what could go wrong mixing an OG with an OG and some of them did well. Some of them didn't do as well as the other ones. Um, but yeah, lots of exciting stuff when you work with those, you know, types of genetics, the Kushes and, and the Bubba's and that stuff, what kind of pops out. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, in general, would you say there's a certain type of plant that your Larry line pairs well with, or is it more of like a case by case basis? It's kind of case by case. You know, I mean, I obviously like tend to want to breed with plants that I enjoy smoking. (laughs) So, um, you know, I've done a bunch of work with Bubba's and, and Urkel's and, um, Grape Ape and, you know, just some of this some of the older classics, you know, and, um, I'm glad I did cause some of them I don't even have anymore. Um, but I wouldn't say it necessarily pairs better with some, but I did do an early on super silver haze cross and, um, it did not really pair well. The phenos kind of like were all over the place and I just didn't really find anything that I really enjoyed and wanted to keep. Ah, okay. That's interesting. That's cool. I guess as a as a general question, you know, when we when we talk to breeders, you know, we often talk about the crosses that work, but you you interestingly have touched on a topic we sometimes discuss, which is that sometimes crosses don't work. And I guess as a general sort of discussion, you know, how often do you find that's the case? Do you find that most of the time crosses work and it's only rarely you have to sort of be like, you know what, this one didn't quite work out, or is it a bit more even across the board? So like I'll, I gauge what I'm going to, you know, drop to people and release, um, an offer publicly based on my testing experiences with the, with the crosses. So, I mean, sometimes I'll run 20 seeds. Sometimes I'll run, you know, a hundred seeds depending on the cross. And, um, some things just don't work. And like, I have a huge stack of things that I'll never release because I did not find them to be good at all (laughs) and it's like i'll never revisit some things you know like there's just it's like a a lesson learned just super skunk i did a couple super skunk crosses with the larry um didn't enjoy any of those um years back when i still had the mass super skunk those plants just the structure on them just was not like desirable at all like from a grower standpoint, cultivating them, they, they were just branches flopping all over the place and just, just wasn't something I would, I would ever, you know, pass out even for free, like just, just a waste of time there. So, I mean, I've, I've definitely had plenty of trial and error and plenty of error, <laughs> which is kind of like, you know, obviously helped with, you know, success because I know what not to do. So, <laughs> Yeah, there's there's definitely plenty of crosses that went bad. No, I love that. I'm going to steal that phrase, you know. I've trialed an error and I've also just had error. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the mass super skunk. You know, recently we've had a, a few episodes sort of with discussions around that featuring Skunk VA and Staten Island. Um, how would you describe the mass super skunk you were familiar with? Um, it wasn't so much like on the rotten, skunky kind of side of things. Um, it wasn't sweet either, but it just, it tasted really good. It had a really good terpene profile to it. Um, it yielded really well. 
it kind of grew in like this kind of crazy bush. Um, I haven't seen that plant in probably a decade. It's probably been about 10 years since I've had it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's not what people think of when they think of like a roadkill or, or something like that. But, um, it was a unique one. It was a fun one to play around with. Sure. I can see where, like, I can see like where the, the diesel and, and, and some of that stuff, you know, like I can see the relation in that line. Yeah, no, it's okay. And and have you ever been in search for the, the roadkill like summer or has it not quite piqued your curiosity in the same way? Yeah, I mean, being from Michigan, we used to have tons of roadkill skunk here. That's kind of like what I grew up smoking, like when I got good flowers. Um, I just, I, I have not been able to find it. It's something that's, I haven't like gone out of my way, like in a crazy way to try to find it, but it's not something that I think is kind of just like floating around anymore. I think maybe, if, maybe some old heads kind of keeping it close maybe, but I mean, I've had discussions with a lot of people in the industry and everyone's kind of like leaning toward the same thing as me. It's like maybe that phenotype has been kind of like isolated away or something and just people didn't find it desirable for a period of time when, you know, growing wasn't legal and, you know, people were worried about, you know, smell issues and stuff like that. It kind of maybe just kind of faded and took like a back seat. Hopefully it's around somewhere because I know that, you know, people would just love to have that in seed form and, and have somebody that's working with it and breeding with it. But, you know, it's something I think is kind of rare now. I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen it in years, probably 2004, 2005, maybe. And and what was your recollection of it? Because, you know, some of the more modern accounts we get from people who are really on the search for it, they'll say, oh, you know, I found something that's kind of similar, but potency is really not there. Do you remember it as a potent strain or was this back in the time where, you know, weed was scarce and so maybe tolerances were a bit lower and, you know, I guess maybe if I distill this question down, do you think it is that mythical hype thing that some people make it out to be or do you think there's an element of like reminiscent rose shade sort of glasses? I mean, if I'm being honest, I think it's like a reminiscent thing where it's just like you're, you have this concept or this idea of, of something that really wasn't what it was. You know, I think, I think that skunk smell was tremendous. I remember like smoking a joint and just reeking to high hell of skunk and it just like would not come out of your clothes. And just like, if you, if you had like a gram or a couple grams in a, in a little baggie that it, you could smell it. Like when somebody walked into a room, you know, they were had, they had the skunk on them. It was just stuck to the, stuck to the sandwich bag, resinous, funky, but I don't think that the high was probably incredibly like earth shattering compared to some of the stuff that's available now. Um, I think that part of it's kind of like mythical in a sense. Um, my tolerance was not incredible then. Uh, I was young. I haven't experienced at that point a bunch of different kinds of cannabis and what cannabis really had to offer. So to me, it was shatteringly strong. It was, it was wreck your world type of thing. But in comparison to, you know, what, something that's, you know, 10% or 12% or something, you know, like it's in the world of lab testing and, and all this stuff that, you know, everybody's so concerned about THC content percentages and everything. I don't think that it would be something that would basically like dominate records. You know, I think it was just good at that time because it's what was available and, and that was the best of it, you know. Yeah, certainly. That that all makes sense and that, that correlates with some of the accounts I've heard from other people. You, you touched on a number of really interesting talking points in that answer, so I would love to touch on a few of them. And the first being, you know, the THC percentage predicament, which is a bit of a tongue tire. So, you know, there's like a bit of a common sentiment in the community that, uh, you know, we're, we're too dominated by THC percentages. And I guess more specifically, there's this push that we need to try to educate consumers to, to not focus on it so much. I guess the question is, do you think it's possible to do this? Or do you think that the general consumer is going to follow numbers to an extent? And it's really like the hardcore community like that yourself and I exist in that, you know, have the luxury of sort of being like, well, you know, THC percentages aren't everything. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I agree with that. I wholeheartedly I agree. Like it's when I when I go into a dispensary, not that I do it often, and you know, but if I, if I go into, I'm not worried. I'm not looking at THC content percentages. Like I want flavor. I want you know, I want to experience something other than what I have in my house. So I don't base what I what I buy or or what I grow on THC content. But I do also, as a, as a seed maker, realize that people do get seeds and they want high testing THC content genetics. So it's really like this place in the market and in the industry right now where it's, it's like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You, know? um, you, you have to produce things that are going to have high test scores because at the end of the day, you still have to give the people what they're looking for. But you're also fighting like the ignorance of saying like you know thc doesn't matter the content doesn't matter this lab test doesn't matter and it it's a weird point right now that we're at where i think that the dynamic will shift and people will start to just appreciate flowers again because they can just go get wax or go get oil if they want to get wrecked um but I think that that whole thing is going to kind of change soon. And I'm kind of seeing it where people are kind of like more interested in terpene profiles and, you know, basically those kind of lab tests where it's like, what kind of active flavors are you going to get out of the flowers as opposed to what's the THC content? Um, but as a breeder, it really puts you in a really hard place where it's like, you just kind of want to, you know, mess around with, with things and make something unique, but it's like, you're kind of also like forced to kind of like kowtow to this whole, we need high testers thing. So it's, it's definitely a, definitely an issue in my opinion. Like, I don't know. It's a weird place to be in right now. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Certainly. I mean, you know, another, another point that you, you touched on is that, you know, the roadkill skunk likely wasn't as potent as some of the more modern stuff and there's there's like an element of being reminiscent. And I guess, you know, recently there's been a resurgence of older genetics, especially in the context of people looking within them to sort of make new hybrids going forward. And, you know, you can sort of look at like Tom Hill's sort of, you know, been um, toying with his haze and we've seen Todd McCormick and Caleb and Matt Riot do their nl5 re-releases respectively have you ever had any curiosity to look in some of this older stuff and do you think it might be like a viable path forward to blend some of that old with some of that new absolutely i mean in my opinion a lot of these current genetics used a lot of that old dutch you know sensi seed bank you know some of the some of those lines um and i think it would be foolish not to revisit some of the older stuff you know especially the northern lights or or this, you know, the, some of the skunk lines. And, I mean, I would love to, to do a bunch of Sensi star work. I used to love Sensi star. Um, it was just like this funky, you know, stank gooey flower that just like, I, I was lucky to get my hands on and, you know, it was getting grown locally. And it just, every time I got it, it was just amazing, you know? So I, I personally would love to work with something like that or like the old AK 47, you know, some of the guys I've seen, you know, over the past like decade or so, they they did an AK-47, a Cherry Fino. It still wasn't what I remember it being, but it, it was pretty good. But yeah, I think that's great. I think you should always try to bring back some of the old stuff and kind of like pay homage to it and, and give it the respect it deserves. It's, you know, part of the stepping stone to where we are now is is due to you know, some of those genetics. So yeah, I'm, I'm pumped to see what some of these guys do with some of the older stuff. Yeah. Likewise, likewise. And you sort of touched on it with that answer there, but I guess I'll throw, throw it open to any other ones, you know, are there any strains besides say the Sensi star that have left a lasting memory for you, but you sadly no longer have access to? Yeah. So like I have, I have the Indiana bubble gum. It's good. But the bubble gum in the late 90s, the early 2000s, was amazing. It was completely different than the Indiana bubble gum. And if I could get my hands on that one, I would, I would love to work with that. The bubble gum was just, it had like this, 
like really playful kind of like uplifting kind of buzz but it wasn't like anxiety driven it was just kind of like euphoric you know um i loved it um the cotton candy back in the late 90s early 2000 that was a great one great flavor great high there's a small handful of ones that i would i would personally put on my list there to uh to do a couple projects with for sure yeah awesome awesome take me back to earlier we were discussing how you were getting into cannabis you were growing you were getting your hands on these cool genetics at what point did you officially decide to start skunk house genetics so the concept the idea the name of skunk house was kind of something i threw around in the forum days and like you know 07 08 it was kind of like my tag my sign off line it was like skunk house you know it came up with skunk master flex as a, as a screen name um, you know, it was just kind of like my little, my little house, my little, you know, grow. I used to call this, this skunk dungeon, skunk house. So skunk house genetics was kind of just like, kind of like organic. It kind of just like happened on its own. <clears throat> um, it wasn't until I had met respect on the forums and he was going through some stuff, um, financially, uh, his wife had some health issues and he was, he was in a tough spot and we kind of went back and forth on it. And he was like, Hey, you know, let's, let's, let's drop this seed. Let's create some, you know, revenue would really, really, you know, it would be a big deal to me. It would really help me out. We kind of launched skunk house and I was, you know, just, it was a bunch of projects that I had done just breeding. And I'm, you know, with the intent of just, you know, being basically personal work of my own and, not really being like, you know, a seed breeder and dropping genetics for public. But um, that was basically how I launched uh, Skunk House was just based on his situation. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll start Skunk House. And he had California Seed Bank. So um, we did all the vending through California Seed Bank. And uh, that was a uh, rock and roll history there. Yeah, that's that's awesome to hear. And what were some of the first releases, and and were they the first ones to get some traction with the public, or did it take a little bit of time before the general public started to realize the quality of the work? So the first releases were like um, 20, 2017. I did my first drop. Um, it was a bunch of Larry uh, OG F seven uh, work bunch of crosses but the year previous to that i went to the high times cup here in michigan and was just kind of like giving out packs of seeds you know just kind of like spreading them out like hey you know hunt these have a good time with them and, and a bunch of my buddies hunted them a bunch of random people that years down the road you know when i had a booth and was bending seed came up and they said hey man you know you gave me packs like just tossed me packs back like, you know, two years ago and they were just epic and, you know, just want to support the brand now. And, um, the original releases were the F8 stuff. And I think it was like, I did like Chem 4, Chem 91, TK, um, a couple different OG Kushes. Uh, I think I did like the original Bubba, the 98 Bubba. Um, there was a handful of other crosses that I made, but that was, that was our first, my first seed drop that I ever did was, was the OG stuff, um, which was, was just amazing. It's some of the stuff that came out of there was incredible. Um, people got their hands on that. Uh, they just wanted more. So I further worked the Larry line to, to F8. I was working with the F8 mail. Um, that was when the GMO got brought in um, with the Han Solo burger. That was the first GMO cross that I did for public drop. Um, also the um, pollen donor to make the Donnie burger to create the, the BX. So it was, that was a pretty legendary drop. Yeah, hugely, hugely. And I've got a, a bunch of questions about the, the Donnie burger, the Han Solo burger and all that. Uh, the first one I'd love to swing by you is, one we actually got from a listener, um, which was what sort of stimulated you initially to begin the burger lines? Um, I wanted to work with the GMO because it had such a like impact on my life that it just, 
it was something that I needed to do a cross with. And then once I did do a cross with it, I realized the potential that it could use <clears throat> down the road genetically and, and doing hybrids with it. And um, like I said, isolating certain phenotypes that just flowered shorter and just expressed things that were kind of unique. It just, it was like a gene pool that you just kind of like rolled the dice with and you're like, well, you know, let's, let's kind of see what comes out of this. Let's see what kind of unique things we can do and what we can accomplish, you know? And when I was making the seed, I didn't really realize how it passed, um, you know, hash potential to other genetics, ones that maybe necessarily didn't really hash super well and how it kind of like lended a hand to kind of give them a little boost. And, um, once, once I did realize this is kind of like a no brainer to be like, you know, we're going to do, we're going to do a, a GMO line and we're just going to do like, you know, kind of like back cross it a few times and, and then kind of work that and kind of just see where it goes and just, you know, it opened up a whole new door to things that were, were amazing that just kind of like went their own directions, you know? Yeah, no, that's brilliant because it segues exactly into what I was going to ask you next, which is as you progress further into the GMO back crosses with the burger lines, was your intended process to create something that's essentially the GMO in seed form or were you looking to do something that was sort of standing on its own two legs and maybe representing both sides of the lineage a little more? So like when I do the straight GMO crosses, when I do the BX2 or the BX3 or the BX4s that I finished uh, a couple months back or, you know, do a BX5, like my intent with that on its own is to definitely lock in the GMO, um, but like kind of alter a little bit, you know, to kind of like isolate certain traits, certain things that I find less desirable. Like, I've, you know, like I've said a few times now, like, you know, the flowering time and stuff like that, but that's definitely to keep the the majority of the GMO in there. Um, when I do the outcrosses, it, my main goal with that, um, what I envision anyways, is just using the parts of it that I like and trying to eliminate the parts that I don't like and kind of let whatever, um, female I'm using in the cross kind of like influence it more than the actual pollen from, uh, the BX2 or the BX3 or any of the burger stuff, you know, I just, I want to bring in a little bit of funkiness from that GMO. Um, but I want to like, you know, bring in the stuff that, that, you know, people are really looking for that, you know, they want, they want hashers, they want yields, they want, you know, stack, they want, you know, that smell, but like not dominated. They want like something else, you know, it's like the GMO is just like an incredible tool to kind of like, loan to other things to kind of like enhance them you know it's like the secret it's like the secret ingredient that like you know your grandma leaves out of the cooking recipe that she doesn't tell you about <laughs> <laughs> that's cool i mean you you sort of touched on it but i did want to formally get an answer to you know what would be your sales pitch for someone who's sort of looking at the double burger the triple burger maybe even the han solo burger if they get their hands on some of the seeds you know, how would you describe this to them in terms of what they should expect if they run a pack of these seeds? Um, expect something that is completely different than the rest of the stuff you have in your garden. It's it's going to be foul. It's going to have, you know, kind of like that stink, you know, that that something different. You know what I mean? It's it's not a it's not a candy. It's not a dessert kind of thing. It's it's like its own class, which you know, I, which is what I believe is kind of like what makes it stand out. You know, it kind of created a different category. They, I mean, it, it existed a little bit. You know, and obviously the chem D was around, and the chem D's got that kind of funk to it. But it, there wasn't like a whole category of those kind of genetics where it's like disgusting, foul. You know, and now you have that getting crossed with something that smells awesome that's you know fruity and, and now you got funky fruity and you know it's i guess my sales pitch would be you know it's just different it's a it's a breath of fresh air to have something that's not the same thing regurgitated over and over and over again yeah certainly certainly and you know you you sort of 
touch on this idea that you mentioned in, I don't know if I'd call it your slogan, but I remembered seeing it on your website and it just says that, you know, you've got to focus on high yields and unique terps. And, you know, by virtue of what you've just said, that stands true. I guess the follow-up question is, to what degree do you feel like these are important factors in the current market? Because to be honest, we've never really heard people talk about high yield being like a necessity or like something that they're looking to actively breed. But as time goes by, I think we are seeing an emergence of this becoming like a more accepted um, attribute that plants need to have in the modern climate, you know. Where do you sit on that? Do you think like, you know, unique terps, obviously, but high yielding, do you think that this is something that needs to be factored in by more people across the board to make strains more viable? So I think I think in places where you're seeing uh, the price of cannabis, you know, botting them out. I, I think that the yield does matter. Um, obviously not everything has to be grown for, for personal smoke and, and, you know, um, not everything that's incredible yielding is going to have devastating highs, but you need to offset something genetically to make up for, um, you know, expenses. So yield is important. It's not the most important, but it's definitely in the top three. If you're in the legal market or even, you know, non-legal market, it's just where cannabis here in, in the States has gone is just, it's gone down. Like the pricing and, and the availability is high. So I think that yield is becoming more relevant. I think people used to say that the yield doesn't matter. But I think that dynamic is going to shift. It already has shifted here where I'm at. I know that, you know, commercially, there's just some things that aren't viable to grow because of yield. Like you couldn't do rooms of Urkel and some of this bubble and stuff. And, and if you did, your, your price tag would have to justify the fact that it yields or it veges or it takes, you know, more time and it costs more to cultivate. And um, I think a lot of these companies are offsetting with things that yield. So, um, like I said, that's taking some of this burger genetic and crossing it to things that don't yield and kind of utilizing the, the GMO and, you know, what it does in a commercial setting minus the time is, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great method for, for success. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And I want to touch a little bit on the Michigan scene because it's not one we've spoken about extensively in the past. And yeah, I do remember reading an article the other day and I I might be getting this wrong, but I, it basically said something to the effect that like Michigan is one of, if not the the largest flower producing states in the USA right now, which again, I might have misremembered that quote, but it regardless of whether it was the most or like still second to California or whatever, the point remains like it's it's a very quickly rising star and it's it's I shouldn't say rising star. It's been doing its thing for a long time, right? But how would you describe the state of Michigan at the moment? And do you feel like it is having a big surge and putting it on par with somewhere like California? Oh yeah, the surge is enormous here. I mean, I've been to, uh, countless facilities, um, done a bunch of walkthroughs. There's some, I mean, Michigan has an, a very impressive cultivation, um, department in general, like our, our cultivating here, our hash making here. I mean, it just, it escalated so quick. Um, there's so many companies that are involved now and the market is just so saturated that you really have to be like at the top of your game. Um, I know I just entered the legal market. Um, shout out to ProGrow, uh, my team over there. Um, they guys do an amazing job. I mean, you eat off the floor, it's so clean in the place. Um, just on scale, like it's just, you really just gotta be at the top of your game and, and those guys over there are just incredible. And I mean, it's just, I don't, I don't know how to describe it besides like maybe like the boom in California market. You know what I mean? It's just, it really makes people rise to the occasion and really hone in their craft. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And I mean, you sort of just touched on it, but do you think pairing with like a big facility is one of the only viable ways to go forward as a breeder? Or do you think you could do your thing as a small um, home scale hobby enthusiast sort of operation or do you really need that size and scale to be making an impact um i think you could do it on your own i think quality just has to be has to be there 
Um, I mean, I'm still, you know, a caregiver of sorts, like on my own little personal grow and stuff like that. And, and I, I always will have some kind of a grow going. Um, so, I mean, there's always room for that, but it's definitely becoming smaller and the opportunity is, is less. Um, these big facilities are definitely crushing the caregiver market here, but I think that high quality flour is always going to be in demand. And if you can, you know, find a way to cultivate like, like my guys over there have, um, and scale up to that level and still produce that kind of quality. I think, uh, I think it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, hugely, hugely. And what do you think is the future for the mom and pop growers in Michigan? Do you think that, you know, we're going to see a similar thing to what happened in California where over time the smaller producers may get forced out of the market due to economies of scale and other sort of factors like that? Absolutely. I mean, you're, you're already seeing that now. You're seeing, you know, even even commercial grows, I mean, that just aren't, hitting their numbers and just doing work properly and, and, and just really, you know, honing in their cultivation departments, they're, they're getting wiped out. I mean, it's, it's sad to see, but it's, it's the same thing that kind of happened in California or any of these other States, you know, it's just, you, you really got to step your game up and really just take advantage of a full work day and, and put in the work, and put in the time and, and take pride in what you're trying to produce and, um, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, it's, yeah, it's these, these small places are going down and it's not necessarily because they're small, but just because, you know, other people are rising more to the occasion. Yeah. Okay. And, and so what would be your glass ball prediction for 10 years time? Where do you think the industry will be? Do you think we're all going to be puffing on vape sticks and no one cares for flour anymore? Cause I have to admit you know, I um. Although I live in Australia, uh, my brother-in-law he he lives in America and he's like twenty-two, right? So he's young and he's like my pulse on the general sort of um you know casual smokers. And he he calls me a dinosaur for smoking flour. He's like, bro, get a vape <laughs> stick. Like, you know, where do you, where do you think we'll be in ten years' time if that is sort of the sentiment we see from some of the younger generations? Yeah, I get that. I mean, I definitely, I get that. I understand where, where, you know, you're coming from on that sentiment. Like you're seeing flower kind of becoming less relevant, but you know, here, like 10 years ago, people were like flower was dead to them and everybody was just dabbing. They were just hitting oil, you know? And now it's like the oil market's like probably 10% of the sales or something, you know? So I think things are, you know, kind of not necessarily dying or, or transitioning, but there's like little phases and then people kind of like get out of that. And they're just like, well, I, you know, hit flower the other day. And it's just like, wow, I missed it. Like, I don't know why I was just smoking so much oil and wasn't really rolling anything up. So I think that you'll go through these little tiny phases where, you know, things will lose relevance and then they'll gain relevance again. So I mean, it would, for me, it would be devastating because I am a flower smoker like through and through and I can't really appreciate oil as much as, you know, some of these other guys. Um, these vape things are super convenient. Like, I'm not going to lie. I carry a, a rosin disposable pen in my pocket most of the day. And it's just, you know, I can't just spark up uh, a joint anywhere I go and you know, sometimes I don't want to smoke a whole joint. I just want a couple hits and the whole vape game has just made it very convenient. And I mean, I, I, I love vapes, but it's never going to be flower to me. It's always just like an ease to get through until I can smoke some flower. <laughs> 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 I like that. I can relate for sure. And, you know, you, you talked of how, you know, these things sort of ebb and flow, like when you were mentioning like, you know, the BHO and concentrates in that same vein, you know, on the show, we often talk about the flavor of the month being very cyclical, you know, it's like fashion, you know, these things go in circles. And at the moment, the consensus seems to be that the dominant flavor in the market you know, for lack of a better term, is the purple candy gas. You know, if you look at 
people like Compound and Cookies and the guys who are sort of dominating the market. That's the general vibe. I want to know, what's your flavor prediction for the future? What do you think is due to come back around? Oh, is coming back. Gas is, gas is making its way back around. Nothing would make me more happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, but yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. There's definitely like this huge wave of lemon cherry gelato and, and, and that whole kind of vibe. Um, it's, it'll be like, you know, it'll be like cookies, you know, when cookies hit here, people were like, you know, what's OG? It's everything's cookies, like OG's dead. And then, you know, cookies kind of started to fizzle out and then you started getting these different gelato kind of things that were kind of similar and people went on these little tiny phases where, you know, it was like the lemon cherry gelatos and the nonsense and, you know, they all have their place and I've had some of them and I was impressed by some of them and, you know, I kind of get tired of them after a little while. They're not something that's, you know, like a kush to me where I can smoke it day in and day out. It's not like a desert island strain for me. But, um, yeah, I've enjoyed some of them. I can see their relevance for a period of time. And these guys have really good marketing. <laughs> so that doesn't that doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's like flavor of the week for sure stuff. Um, the diesels and the chems and the, and the cushions are going to make their way back. And they already are. I think it's just that they're not as accessible to some people as some of this other stuff is. So it might take a little bit longer. But done properly and... You know, I guess marketed correctly. I think that the uh, the Kush wave will be here again. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And you know, you mentioned cookies, and then how it gave way to gelatos and the more newer waves. I'd love to ask you. You know, a lot of people talk as though you know cookies, and then progressing to gelato, and then maybe the more modern extension is you know like your RS elevens now. Do you feel like this is a genetic dead end that sometimes people talk of it as? Do you do you agree with that sentiment and would it ever stop you from breeding with that stuff or are you not quite of the view that, you know, it's this doom and gloom genetic dead end? I mean, I think that some of these guys are going to hit dead ends where it's just so many things combined that it's just not unique and, and just has no value to really contribute to cannabis. You know what I mean? Um, some of these other guys, um, that are doing some of this breeding, they're really kind of looking to isolate certain things and, and be unique. And I think that will make way to the next phase of where things kind of go and there'll be heavy contributors to helping out, um, where we go with all this genetically, but there's definitely people, you know, and a lot of that stuff's like money grab stuff where it's like, I'm going to use the hottest flavor and cross it to, um, whatever it is that I got going on and, and kind of, you know, do it for sales, you know, everybody has to do a little bit of it, but you know, some of these guys are, like you said, they, you know, they're bringing back some of this old stuff. And I think some of those genetic lines are definitely responsible for a lot of the stuff that we see. So, you know, through isolation of, of certain traits and other things, I think, I think we'll have different waves and different directions that we go in and people have different needs and wants and, They'll breed for those and then we'll move on to the next phase. Try to be as optimistic as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. It's sort of, you know, I've, I've said this once or twice on the show, but it sort of makes me want to like get like someone on the show who's like hectically down the rabbit hole of like the craft beer industry or something because I'm sure there are other industries that have gone through what we're experiencing where like you know Budweiser dominated the market and the real heady you know the equivalent of the haze of craft beer or whatever falls off because no one wants to pay for it and and yet we see you know a resurgence of the craft beer scene now so I'm sure that in time these things will stay around and pop back up but I wonder what the life cycle is. Yeah, I mean, like with the beer industry, because you brought it up, I'll use that as an analogy. Like, you, you know, if you told somebody in the 80s that sour beer was going to be a thing, you know, they'd be like, yeah, for what? You know, what's no, it's not. Well, there's a whole category of sours now, you know. Um, so, I mean, I think as long as people are kind of like being, you know, ingenuitive about how they're doing their breeding. I think that people are going to stumble upon things that kind of like open up doorways to different paths that kind of really help benefit, you know, the industry as a whole. And, you know, who knows what those are, you know, it could be, you know, some of these Northern Lights projects that you're talking about people working with, or, you know, some of these other old school ones, 
um, getting brought and mashed together some of the newer age genetics and kind of opening up doorways that we didn't know. I think certain things are going to basically be maxed out or are maxed out. I don't think weed is going to really necessarily get much stronger um, as far as like lab testing goes. I think we're pretty much maxed out in there. I can't really imagine something breaking 40 plus percent. It just like doesn't seem possible. You know, you need so much of it to actually be plant matter to hold trichome. So I think we're kind of getting close to a dead end or at a dead end with potency, uh, unless they figure out some like chemicals that are in certain genetics that they're not able to test for or not testing for, or maybe a certain combination of certain active chemicals, um, basically making you feel more stoned as a whole. But I think flavors are going to be the terpene game is going to be where things are going. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, and uh, I'd love to ask you because you mentioned it. What do you think is like the the rough ballpark percentage you would be comfortable accepting? Because for a long time, you know, I talk to people about. I think in the past I've said anything above thirty percent. I just don't know if I can really believe it. What's your thoughts on that one? Um, you know, it's like one of those you take a you take flowers and you get it tested at three different labs. And you get slightly different numbers from every lab. So I guess until they figure out some honest gold standard, you know, who's to say what is and what isn't, you know? Um, I have the Han Solo that, that we have here in Michigan that we have available um, on the legal market. It'll test at 37, 38%. And I mean, when you smoke it, you know, it's strong. It's, you know, are those numbers accurate? I don't know. We tested at a few different labs and they came up like that. They've retested it and it came up the same. Um, so who's really to say? Um, that kind of goes back on the whole what we were talking about earlier. Like, do numbers really matter? You know, and shouldn't it be more on the end user and, and, and the effect that they get? That's That's what I think. I think that THC content is not irrelevant, but it shouldn't be the thing that you're focused on as a consumer when you walk into a shop. Yeah, certainly. Well, look, you know, you touched on the idea of standardization, and I think in order to get that, there would probably likely need to be federal legalization. So I'd love to ask you, what's your thoughts on the idea of impending federal legalization in the States, and how do you think it might change the landscape of the industry? Well, I think it's going to happen eventually because the government wants their money. (laughs) um and that's as simple as that is i mean that's the majority of the states you know besides people going in there and actually voting but it's tax money you know it's it's revenue it's standardizing it across on a federal level is eventually one day going to happen because it would it would eliminate you know the black market basically for the most part um it's definitely the impact that they've had through legalization has has destroyed the black market um, to a certain point already. So I don't see why they would stop. It's only going to get them more money in their 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 hands by making it federally legal. Um, I think it'll be cool to see how it unfolds with these companies doing multi-state now and continuing to spread across where you're going to get companies that are like the Marlboro of weed where it's like, you know, just absolutely trash. There's no craft at all to it. It's just packs of joints for dirt. And some people will be okay with that. Some people don't care. You know, there's people going to a store and buy bush beer all the time and it's cheap as hell. Um, and some people, you know, buy a four pack that costs as much as a whole case of beer. And that market's always going to be there. So whether it's through full legalization on a federal level or, things stay how they are and probably probably will for another what maybe two or three years but i think it'll be a hard push through that and i think we're going to see some big changes and it's going to be harder to play ball here for sure yeah sure and i mean what might be your advice for anyone who's you know trying to establish themselves in an industry where it feels like it's becoming increasingly difficult because i have heard this sentiment from a few people who are 
you know, just sort of starting to get really passionate about cannabis. And the gist of what they express is that, like, it's never felt more difficult than ever to say, try to be a breeder or to be a grower who's not just, you know, providing myself with some flowers, but trying to actually get into the industry. Any advice you might be able to give people? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the same sentiment that I've said, you know, since 2000, 99, 98, when I first started smoking, like, it's all going to be genetic, you know, um, learning to cultivate that genetic properly and, and, and on a craft level is obviously a huge ticket to that. But, um, you know, having something unique, if, if every store you walked into to buy any product, if all the products were the same, then why are you buying one company over another company? You know, if, if quality is the same and, and the product's the same, then what does it matter? You know? So my thing that I would say to people to not discourage them is that you need to fucking pop seeds, man. You need to find some unique shit that people don't have and kind of separate yourself and, and kind of make your own way and kind of, you know, kind of do that whole route because it's, it's, you know, only a race to the bottom. If you're playing by the same rules, if you're making up your own genetic pool and, you're kind of like, you know, got unique products, then it's, there's always going to be an audience for that. You know, just, it's part of the whole adapting to um, the whole game. You know, it's just, you got to have your own unique twist on it and, and play. Yeah, definitely. That's certainly a sentiment I can get behind. I've been trying to sort of push that a bit myself, you know, encouraging people to do their own thing and as opposed to trying to do your own Cushman's hybrid, I'm sure JBZ can probably do a better one than you or I. So um, in that line of thought, you know, what would be your advice to someone who wants to start their own breeding project? And specifically, how would you advise them in terms of like selecting the genetics? Would you say work with stuff that's totally different to what other people are using? Or would you say work with what you're passionate about and then try to drive it in a direction that's unique? Where would you start? I mean, I always use the passion route because if you don't really stand behind anything you're doing, then the second that it starts to not make sense, like on a financial level, you're going to want to back away. And that's breeding is like a long game. If you're doing it right, it's, I mean, you can't like rush the process. Um, you're going to want to use stuff that people like, but put your twist on it. You know what I mean? It's take, take your passion and kind of make a fusion of, of what other people, you know, around you have passion about when it comes to cannabis. And I mean, I do it in my lines, you know, not, I, I'm not crazy about, you know, gelatos and some of these other things that over the years I've used. Um, but to take something like that and then put my twist on it and kind of like put my tag on it and say like, it's like gelato's okay. But this thing that I did to it makes it better and you want to run these seeds, you know? So my suggestion to people is always use passion. It's always, always the thing that's going to be um, the accelerator in, in your career. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And uh, before we get to talking about male selection, which is always a topic people are keen to hear about, I want to ask, I've heard increasing sentiments not just from breeders, but more importantly, from actual seed banks and seed bank owners that they feel that there's been a bit of a change in the market demand and that the majority of the market is primarily only interested in feminized seeds these days. Have you noticed that reflection within your own sales? And what's your thoughts on a growing demand for feminized and less interest in regular seeds? I mean, feminized seeds have definitely progressed to be more popular than they used to be, um, uh, without a doubt. Um, I think that's great. I think that there's a certain market, a certain percentage of the seed popping market that doesn't have the space to deal with male plants. So they don't care for them. They don't, they don't need to have it in their stock. And I think I, I mean, I do understand that completely. So that's a big part of what makes fe uh, feminized seeds, you know, relevant. Um, it kind of eliminates the selection process and makes it easier to make genetic combinations, but there is trial and error involved with reversal of, of female genetics. And sometimes some plants don't want to, 
So there's a lot of, you know, trial and error that goes along with that. So, I mean, they both have their own obstacles, but traditional breeding is a lot more on the selection. Now, none of these factors matter if you're running and testing your seeds and, and seeing what comes of them. You're just kind of wasting space and you're not burning people's time and their money. So um, that's really on the breeder's end. But I mean, I definitely see where feminized seeds are are kind of the majority of the market. They're probably more than 50%. They're probably, you know, maybe 60% of the market. Some people are really actively looking for fem seeds. And then, I mean, some people use like autos, you know, I'm, haven't really gotten to autos myself, but um, there's a place for everything. Well, you read my mind because I was going to ask you, you know, I've seen a, a myriad of GMO autos on the markets. Have you ever tried any autos in general or more specifically any of the GMO ones? And what's your thoughts on autos in general? I ran some autos in the early 2000s when I had really, really restricted space and um wasn't really super knowledgeable genetically. Um, had a buddy that went to Amsterdam, brought back some some autos, and I can't even remember what they were at this point. So long ago, but um, not my thing. Um, I guess for out outdoor farmers, they're, they you know a lot of these guys are doing autos. Um, I just don't see them dominating the market over traditional or feminized seeds in general, but the couple guys that are doing the autos are really doing a good job with them. I mean, they've, I've, I've seen the progress. They used to be really bad. And, uh, over the, you know, maybe past five years, some of these guys have really, um, kind of dialed it in and actually gotten some not hemp looking nonsense to come out of them. So, you know, props to them on that. Some of this, some of the autos were just terrible for years. <laughs> definitely you know i think a low rider might have left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth low rider that's what it was yeah low rider there you go there you go um so i guess you know if we just loop back to the question before about the feminized stuff i do wonder you know for a long time people had concerns about breeding with feminized seeds you know and i think that empirically this has been proven to not be a big issue if you think about it in the sense that like Canarado compound a whole bunch of breeders out there you know they make fems and then they find stuff out of that and they make fems and it doesn't appear on the surface that all of the seeds they make are now just hermy riddled but the question is do you feel like over time we may run into issues if we are just using fems to breed endlessly and we don't necessarily incorporate regular males into the genetics I mean, I think so for sure, but I'm not basing that on any kind of scientific information. I'm just logically in my head, it just seems very plausible that you're going to get more reoccurring hermaphrodite traits that are going to pop up when you're refeminizing, refeminizing, and refeminizing. Um, I mean, I know a lot of these guys are using feminized, you know, phenos and reversing them to make further lines. Um, a lot of them aren't having issues right now, but. I mean, you also got to think like some of these clone onlys, maybe some of these chems, look at the chems, you know, was, those were bag seeds. So that was a herm or some kind of possible pollen that floated around. But if you talk to, you know, I believe Cam even said like they were all every seed that he popped was a female. So what are the odds of that being, you know, a pollen donor, you know, from the dog bud or, or whatever the, uh, the mythical chem line was, um, yeah, I think that if you kind of work that long enough for enough years that you're going to fall into some kind of issue. Um, traditional breeding shouldn't be like completely abandoned. I think there's definitely always a place for it, especially with preservation. Um, I think it's just something people got to be careful about and make sure they don't isolate too much of a hermaphrodite trait in the lines that they're doing. Of course, yeah, it sounds like a, a reasonable point. And that's what my thoughts have been is, you know, maybe we don't see it now, but maybe we see it down the track. But to help antidote that, I'd love to know, what do you like to select for in a male? Is there any particular traits you look for? Or do you feel like, you know, I guess maybe a better way to put it is, for you, is it an art or a science? Is it things you're looking for? Or is it more of a feel and, you know, certain males, you're like, this one's talking to me? So it's like a little bit of both. It's like a sweet spot in between. 
Um, like I won't use a male that I don't feel something toward, you know, some kind of like pull gravitational pull of, of me wanting to use it. Um, I'll flower out. Sometimes I'll flower out multiple males. I want to see what the flower sets look like. I want to see how they stretch. I want to see certain qualities that, that you, you know, wouldn't know if you didn't flower them out. Um, in my lines, I never use multiple males. I always use one, but I'll save like the best three. Because if I use a male and I'm like, you know what, this didn't, you know, translate to the offspring how I wanted it to. Let's let's try a different male. So I'll I'll remake it. Oh, I just look nice. for, you know, I, I look for, you know, a structure. I want to see stress test. I want to see drought test. I want to see stem rub. I want to, you know, what I mean. Um, certain leaf set. Um, certain markers that I see. Um that I think would be like stressors, um, stuff like that. It's really like a guessing game, but with a safety net, cause you have other males you can use, you know? Yeah, certainly. I remember, you know, uh, DJ short expressed the sentiment that, you know, he sort of felt like ultimately it was just about popping the seeds. And then that was how you decided if it was a good male or not. Do you feel like that in a sense is where it leaves you? Absolutely, man. Shout out to DJ Short. The guy fucking is amazing. There you go. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we've got a few more of your lines I definitely wanted to touch on, but before I name any specific ones, I want to draw some out of you, which is the first question being, what out of your lines do you feel was the most unexpectedly successful, you know, a bit of a dark horse, so to speak? Um, uh, I used Obama Kush. And I hit the, I hit it with the Donnie Burger. And some of those phenols that came out were like this mothball kind of like fruity mothball kind of just crazy terpene profile. It was the most like one of the most overlooked genetic crosses that I made. It was just like people needed to really like hunt those properly, like do like proper selections on them. Not everything that came out of that line was like just epic but some of it was just like amazing like i was i was just mind blown by some of it um the obama kush is like in the in the fruit have you ever had the obama kush uh are we to I, I think there's two right there's the one from csi and then there's the other one i think i've had the one from csi okay so i think i think originally it came from maybe some of his stock or it was an accidental cross that somebody got a seed in some of his flower it's like, uh, I think it's like Mendo Per crossed with like Bubba, I think is what it is. Yeah, that's the one I've had. Okay, that is, did, how did you feel about it? Did you like it? Yeah, it was awesome. Like real chocolatey, awesome vibes. Yeah, I love I loved that one. Um, use that one and just, you know, like the offspring was just, was just epic in it, man. It was just, I didn't expect it to be as good as it was. It wound up when I tested the seeds. It was just, uh, it was really unique. Ah, that's cool. And it brings up this question I've asked people in the past, which is where do you delineate between something you're happy to put out and something you're not, which is like, let's say you made a cross and 50% of the seeds are like fire, like everyone unanimously would say, this is a keeper, this is incredible. The other 50% of the pack herms consistently. Would you feel comfortable putting a pack like that out? Like, where do you draw the line between something that's good versus like, oh, only some of the plants are good and some of them may be a bit, you know, not ideal? So the herm thing is is a is an issue for me. Like, I wouldn't put out a line that was like a fifty percent herm. Um, now, fifty percent of what comes out of it being good and fifty percent not being great. I would just put that as a disclosure and I'd be like, well, the stuff that came out of it that was good was so fucking amazing. Like you guys really need to to crack through these beans. It's, it's worth the half that aren't good to get the other half, you know, mm -hmm. but the Herm trade and, and, and that thing is just, it's difficult because some people don't have a lot of space and you, you don't want to burn people like that. And I've seen, I've seen some breeders put out some stuff and they, they give people a heads up and they're like, Hey, look, you know, like I made this genetic cross, I made this line. Um, Herms have popped up. Like, is this something that you guys want to see? W w how would you feel about me releasing it? You know, and I've seen it. I've seen breeders like reach out and ask the people and they're like, oh, well, you know, if it's, if what's good is good, then, you know, it's, you know, it's worth it and whatever. So I don't know. There's like, I guess a fine line there. 
where I guess if you tell people what it is and, and, and the issues that you're having with a line. But for me, I just I just stay away from it. I don't need that kind of problem. And, you know, not everybody's, you know, fluent on social media where they see everything that's posted. And if somebody just goes on a on a seed bank or on a website and they buy something and they don't know the potential, you know, harm that can do their garden, I would just I would hate to be somebody that ruins somebody's time like that. Growing should be fun. To eliminate as much problem for the consumer as possible is just it's the only honest way to do any of this now. Yeah, totally, totally. So, I mean, on that same sort of line of question, if you could only recommend one of your packs to someone without knowing anything about them, which pack would you recommend? And I guess the easy way to think of this is what's just a general sort of, I don't know, I don't want to use the word cookie cutter, but like what's something where you think most everyone would be pretty stoked with what they got from it? So I would be like, if, if everything was available, you know, I only, I only make genetic crosses once. So whatever I get yield for seed wise out of it, I'll never remake a genetic cross. Um, it's just my way of keeping things unique. But if, if it was all the same, and I had unlimited amounts of everything. I would tell everyone to run the Han Solo burger because, um, that's just, that's something special for me. You know, that's, it's got the GMO in it, which has got its place in my heart. And, and it's got the, the Larry OG line. Um, that I worked on for so long. And it's just kind of like its first mashup of those two where they where they met. And just the selection on there and the range of phenos that popped up were, were so great that it's like if you if you just if you're an OG Kush lover, there was there's plenty of that in there for you. If you loved chem, there's plenty of that in there for you. And it's just it's just it would be my go-to, I guess, to be like if if you want to see what Skunk House's backbone is, like this is this is us represented in seed. I love that. I love that. Well, I wanted to touch on um, a few more of your strains that had been particularly notable for me. This one's going to be a bit of an extended question, but I feel like I've got to get it all out there to help lay the groundwork. So um, I want to know a little bit about the Mike Larry and how it came about. But specifically, you know, the follow up is obviously this one made a lot of waves in the water. It was picked up by Jungle Boys. They ran with it. So the follow-up question is, how much of a boost does that give to your company to have someone like Jungle Boys running with one of your strains? So yeah, how did it come about, Mike Larry, and how did it get picked up by Jungle Boys and what effect did that have? So with the Mike Larry um, and with a lot of genetics that I actually put out, I'm really like like pop culture kind of like infused into cannabis and it's where I get a lot of my ideas for names and and just kind of directions and you know, like Han Solo Burger and Mike Larry and just 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 a lot of these things that are kind of like, I don't know, bringing art and bringing pop culture into cannabis is kind of like, it's that's like my backbone. And um, I guess the most easy way to describe it is like, you know, I'm a I'm a cultivator myself. So I sit around a trim table and BS with buddies while we're, you know, spending hours and hours and just kind of like go off on crazy, you know, talking tangents. And we listen to music in the background and there's, you know, sometimes movies playing in the background. And sometimes that stuff in the background is, is the influence to where I get um, names and, and ideas from. And um, the Mike Larry is just, it was Larry OG and there was bad boys playing in the background, the movie when we were, when we were trimming Finos of it. And, uh, you know, just him saying, I'm Mike Larry and then over and over again, you know, I'm like, this is just, this is the Mike Larry, you know, this is <laughs> <laughs> just some goofball stuff like that, you know, like that's, there was nothing crazy, like wildly creative about it. It was just, um, kind of like put in my head and then it came out. <laughs> That's cool. I love it. And like, yeah. how did the cross come to be? Was it something you were thinking about on paper for a long time and then finally did? Or was it one of those ones where, you know, it was just in the mix and then it sort of stepped forward as a real front runner? It was, um, there was a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of different gelatos and um, I had, I had done the cross um, with a few different variations, different gelato cuts. And um, there was a few that really popped out that really mixed well with the, with the Larry. Um, I think Ivan over at jungle boys kind of recognized that I tossed him a bunch of different uh, seed stock that I made. 
uh, he wanted to do a collab and um uh, you know that one stood out to those guys when they ran it and you know he said why don't we do a uh why don't we do a tk bx you know i'll take your uh your tk larry uh triangle larry and and i'll, I'll cross it back to the tk and we'll, we'll do a, a male line with that and um we really like this mike larry line and we'd like to use it in a bunch of crosses and i said cool let's let's run with it let's see what you you know let's see what we can come up with and uh that's pretty much uh how the jungle boys collab went down that's killer to hear that you know they they recognize the the potential it had and i guess as a as a general sort of marketing sort of angle what what effect does that have on a company to have jungle boys pick it up my gut instinct is that it it helps expose you to a whole new demographic of consumers but maybe that's not necessarily the case how do you feel that that collab sort of affected your overall popularity and notoriety uh definitely positive um ivan is a beast in the industry um Anybody that would say otherwise is just lying to themselves. Um, he sets trends. They, you know, the Jungle Boys do their thing for sure, man. Um, that collab definitely took some of their their viewer base that didn't recognize or didn't know who I was um, and kind of shined a little bit of light on that. Um, and then outside of what it did or what it didn't do for me, it was just kind of cool to work with um, another big industry guy. And, and that was really my first collab I ever did. So it was kind of, uh, you know, I was lucky on my half that I got to, you know, be part of something that cool. Yeah, hugely, hugely. And, um, I just wanted to quickly clarify, you know, cause I, I have seen a number of, um, the jungle boys seed releases and, there is that TK backcross male in the mix. Is that the male that you were referring to that they built off that Mike Larry stock? Yeah. So the TK BX one is, um, I had made, um, TK crossed with Larry, uh, backcross one F8. Um, I gave them seeds of that. They found a killer male. They crossed it back to the triangle Kush, and then they hunted through stock of that. And then, did their line based off of their find that's pretty cool i mean i guess it opens the door to a follow-up question which is you know how do you feel about people breeding with your work because i think the majority of people are usually pretty okay with it but sometimes people have certain requests where do you sit on that one specifically we did get a, a message from one of our listeners who said that um you know, they popped a single pack of Donny Burger, found what they think is like a unicorn, just a really special plant. They said great structure, incredible growth, good yield, deep funky smells, tests really high. Would you have any issues with people breeding with your work? Um, the the only thing that I where I stand with that whole thing is like the only thing I would want to see out of people if they're gonna use any work is just for them to put their own unique twist on it. I mean, I, I think it's awesome when I see people use stuff that I've made. It's it's like contributing to the uh, the industry. You know what I mean? Um, I'm I'm glad and I'm lucky I'm able to do my part. Um, but I do love to see when people actually take something that I did and kind of put their twist on it. I think that makes it like just that much better and more refreshing than seeing somebody just take somebody's work and like make F2s. Or find a male and then just dust a bunch of clone onlys with a male they found and then release the seeds. You know, I don't I don't have any issues with either one of them regardless. It doesn't it doesn't really bother me. But on a on an artistic standpoint, I, I mean I think it's just way more flattering when somebody says, Your work was so good, I wanted to put my own twist on it. And then seeing what they do with it is uh, to me, that's just the, the highest compliment. Yeah, that's awesome to hear, you know, hoping that it inspires some innovation. So, another strain I wanted to touch on was the modified banana line. And the reason why, you know, our listeners are probably sick to death of me saying it, banana OG, one of my favorites. I feel like it's super underrepresented, especially banana as a flavor. You know, you don't see it as often as you might hope. Can you tell us a little bit about the modified banana line and how you might describe it to people? I love the banana OG. It's like one of my favorites. Um, I never get sick of it. It was not even a thought in my head 
um, when I was doing a bunch of the burger lines to somehow work a banana into that. Um, I thought that cross came out epically. Uh, we do a selection here for the legal market and um, in Michigan of the banana and it is just it's killer it's strong it has great flavor it produces well um it's an all-around winner and just uh, like you man i'm just a huge huge banana og fan you know shout out to oregon kid yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. so what sort of plants can people expect to get if they buy any of those crosses because i noticed that um you know, there's still a few seed banks who stock your work who have got a healthy amount of stock. And that's one of the criticisms we get of the show. You know, we talk about all these awesome strains and they're all sold out. So I thought we'd better touch <laughs> on something where they can still grab it. You know, how might you pitch some of those hybrids or in general, what traits do you feel the modified banana mail brings to things? It's like a rotten banana peel, you know, like that's the terpene profile that I would I would say best describes it. It definitely has that banana peel to it, though. Um, it lends it lends in some of the yield. The plant yields very solid. Um, it's not super picky with feed, so you can kind of like you know juice it up and not have to worry about like you know overdoing it. It can kind of take a, a decent feed, a decent heavy feed. Um, if you like banana OG, you're gonna like that banana. It's just that banana comes through so much on it. It's it's hard not to appreciate it. Oh, man, that's gorgeous to hear because I, I have ran a few banana OG hybrids over the years and I feel like it was hard to get a banana dominant expression out of them. Is this something you've ever heard? Um, yeah, because it's, you know, the banana in there is not like really, really heavy, heavy hitting. So um, a lot of times, whatever you're working with genetically and crossing it to, it kind of like powers over that. And all you taste is kind of like a, like the cushy kind of, you know, standard kind of OG ish kind of fucking thing. But um, I did a back to banana cross, which is banana OG crossed with modified banana. And that yielded out some massive banana OG plants. Um, great buds, great structure, great terpene. Um, arguably, if you hunted enough of them, you'd find something even more banana than the actual banana. Um, but just really cool. If anybody ever comes across those and they're still available, like grab them and, and just enjoy the shit out of them. Cause they were, they were so much fun to, to run. Oh, that's excellent to hear. I love it. I forgot to ask you a question a moment ago when we were talking about the Mike Larry, but we did have one of our listeners ask what sort of traits slash plants can they expect to find in the Mike Larry hybrids? I think they were eyeing off a few of them. Any you'd recommend? Yeah, so uh, we I offered the straight Mike Larry um, V2s. Um, the V2s I thought were better than the V1s because I liked the gelato that I used in it better. Uh, the V1, the original Mike Larry used the gelato 45, um, which was solid. It was a solid plant. Um, but the V2s, I used the gelato 41. And that one I thought was a lot more unique and kind of brought more to the table in the cross. Also, it wasn't just the Larry OG in that. I used the Paris Larry, which was Paris OG crossed with Larry um, F8. And I thought that male kind of brought more of the traditional Kush. So if you can find the the Mike Larry V2s, I don't, I don't know if there's any still available or floating around there, but those were pretty amazing um some of the mike larry crosses um i haven't really messed around crazy crazy amounts with the v2 crosses that was something that respected um so i personally didn't you know make or run those um but i could only imagine that there's some killer stuff in them yeah, certainly, certainly. I did notice that you'd use the Paris OG and a few hybrids, and I, I wanted to ask you, was there anything specific about the Paris OG that really drew you to it? Yeah, it was just, um, you know, the, the Paris OG was like a really, I like enjoyed it as like an OG Kush lover. It was just a really unique kind of OG. It kind of structurally grew a little bit differently. It wasn't so lengthy. It was a little bit more stout. Um, 
So I thought that kind of trait was cool from a Kush. Um, when I made the cross and I hunted through the original Paris Larry's, I just noticed that it kind of was bringing up a bunch of different type of kind of like uh, OG Kush um, clone only, you know, traits from like some of the Louis traits and some of the, you know, some of those other ones that I didn't even work with. So I think it kind of was, I don't know, like a, like an amazing tool, you know, to use in a hybrid and kind of just like brought the best of both worlds and, and didn't overpower the gelato and kind of brought its own, you know, OG and just kind of just, you know, just really unique and it's just really fun to grow fun plants. Nice, nice. And like as a follow up to this, I had noticed that the uh the Mikey Mike was pretty similar in terms of the genetic combination. It had a, a lot of real all stars in there, you know, between the gelato, the Paris OG and the Larry OG. And interestingly I noticed, you know, you bred it to the F two and I guess I wanted to ask, was there any th- particular reason you decided to filial breed this one forward? Were there any sort of goals you were looking to hit or was it just a cool line? Uh so the Mikey Mike was just Mike Larry F two um that was a that was a respect cross um i wasn't involved in the breeding of that so that would be kind of like more like a his him question on that one um i don't know if he was breeding it toward certain traits or i'm not really sure exactly what he was looking to get out of that one um probably just more isolated uh whatever you know that he was he thought was good i guess yeah sure and do you guys uh tend to do crosses independently um how does the whole collaboration process work with you two um so for years i was the only one that was pretty much producing seed uh he had an outdoor space that was larger that he was able to utilize um so he did a couple of lines he did uh the lemon lime orange apricot um it was a smaller project he did some double burger crosses and then he did the mike larry the the ones that dropped this year the mike larry's from this year were pretty much a california seed bank trap i didn't have any part of those ones at all okay cool cool and do you guys discuss crosses together as like you know i'm going to do this so you should pursue that or how does that side of it work um we did when we were still working together kind of like brainstorm and say okay well you know i'm gonna i'm gonna go in this direction because this is this is what i want to do this is my passion project and you know he would say okay well i you know i want to do this or whatever and it's like cool you know make the seeds pop them see what you come up with um ultimately at the end of the day uh we both just kind of envisioned things differently than one another so we just kind of parted ways and um he's doing his california seed bank thing and um i'm pursuing the path that i wanted to do with uh skunk house originally so yeah yeah that's awesome to hear that you guys have been able to sort of leave it on a good note I wanted to ask you about a hot topic in the industry at the moment, Uh, something that's been prevalent in the EU scene for a long time, but something which is a bit more freshly discussed in the Americas, which is white labeling of seeds or more specifically, you know, making seeds for other companies and then just sort of letting them decide what they want to do with it. I'd love to open the door to this discussion because I believe you have made some seeds for other breeders in the past. What's your thoughts on white labeling as just a a general sort of topic to begin with? Uh, I think it's, I think it's an acceptable thing to do these days, as long as you're just open about it and tell people what you're doing. Um, Again, it all really falls back on seed testing. Um, The main concern that I think anybody has that's buying seed is they want to know Uh, Are they getting viable, good, tested genetics? And I think as long as that's true on a seed release, then I don't think anything else really much matters. If it's authentic, it's it's what the breeder says it is, and they're standing behind their products, um, I think it's all good. Yeah, certainly, certainly. I can appreciate that sentiment. I guess the follow-up question is like, where do you draw the line, you know? So I'll give you an example and maybe that'll help, you know, flesh out some of the details a little more. But let's just say that, you know, 
old heavy days buys all his seeds from Skunk Master Flex. And, um, you know, I, I on the packs, I, I list all the proper genetics. You know, the lineages are all correct and all the information is essentially correct. Um, and then when people ask me about them, I'm like, oh, you know, I made these ones last year. Like, I guess the question is, at, at what point do you feel like um, you're sort of crossing a line with it? You know, is it okay to say you made these seeds if that, in your opinion is integral to you know the sale of the seeds or do you feel like you'd have to be just a hundred percent up front and be like oh you know i actually didn't make this but like this is what it is and this is what to expect where do you sort of draw the line between like you know protecting a business's sort of identity versus being up front about it oh that's a tough fucking question man good job uh <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh i mean there's I, I I feel like there's so many people in this industry that are just really not even making their own seed. So I would just uh, it's a weird that's a that's a that's a great that's a hard question. Um I mean I guess you're if you're being honest about it, then it is what it is. And fuck. <laughs> <laughs> It's that is incredibly tough to answer because I feel like, you know, when I, when I offer seed, I want to be authentic with people and, you know, open about what's going on and, uh, respected some, some, some seed making for skunk house. And, you know, he popped up and was like, yay, made these seeds and people were like, cool. And he did it under skunk house and he'll probably continue to do under California seed bank and he'll use lines that he worked on and, um, he's putting his own twist on it. So it's, you know, good for him. Do whatever you want. Um, be open about what you're doing. Um, with some of these, like, where, where do you draw the line? I guess people have to draw the line. I guess as a breeder, you're not the one that's drawing the line or the, or the company, the one that's drawing the line. You're just, you're just offering a service and, and you let the people, I guess, decide if, if they want, you know, seed stock being made from who they claim it's being made from and you know i guess ask the breeder for thorough you know information on, on how the seeds were made and, and the process and as long as the the consumer can stomach whatever the information they're being told then i guess uh i guess everyone draws their own line of some sort yeah sure and do you think like this idea or this sort of concept will expand further because as you said there are some breeders in the industry you know i'll use the word loosely breeders um mm -hmm. who who don't make their own seeds and so i guess you could say well you know I, maybe they're like burner you know they're the hype man and they sell the product and that's cool so i guess the question is do you think that that trend will continue and over time we will see people who are like the middleman or the hype guy and breeding becomes you know, more of a backroom sort of thing, you know, I, maybe, maybe the analogy is like with rappers, you know, we're going to have the rappers on the front and the producers in the back room doing the hard yards. Like, how do you see it playing out over the long term? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the music industry is like a perfect reference to use in that, um, you know, like they'll use some super attractive girl that maybe necessarily doesn't have a great voice, but then they'll use like a voice synthesizer and, and, you know, use a studio and, and make her sound a certain type of way. And then, you, you know, you hear her live and you're like, wow, that doesn't even sound like the same person. That's, you know, her voice isn't that great. You know, using that as obviously just an analogy to, you know, like you said, with burner, you have a front man and, you know, who's really doing the work, who's behind the scenes. Um, I guess that's part of their whole marketing though. You know, that's, that's how they're choosing to, you know, make people look at them as a, as a company, like, you know, don't be interested in the guy making the seeds, be interested in the guy that's talking about the seeds. Um, I think it'll continue to happen. It's probably something that's been happening for a long time. You know, um, it's not like Adam Dunn days anymore, where it's, you got these crazy, crazy breeders, you know, that are just like working these crazy lines. It's, there's a lot of F1 stuff coming out and some people like that. And some people want stuff that's for their work. Some people don't want fences. Some people want, you know, IBL lines and they want to see, you know, F2s, F3s, F4s before they want to really, you know, dig too far into a genetic pool and kind of do some pheno hunting. Um, ultimately, it's people dictate the market. So if they keep buying things that 
you know, justify or don't justify a price tag. They're kind of, they're kind of creating the market and legitimizing it. Um, so we'll see what people keep buying and what people stop buying, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I totally stand behind all of that for sure. I get what you're saying, no doubt. So as a as one that's a bit of a, I'll give you some specifics, you know, I've heard of situations where some people get upset that someone else has made the seeds on behalf of a breeder. So I'm not talking about white labeling. Let's just say you come around my place, you bring around a bunch of plants and you're like, hey, here's the male. I selected it out. I want you to hit all these females with it. And then, you know, we'll have our agreement. I'll give you whatever. And we're all happy with that. And then later on, you know, the the person will be like, well, I did the pollination. You know, it's it's not, you didn't, this guy didn't actually make the seeds. I guess the question is, in my mind, it seems reasonable to believe that like if you select the male and drop off all the plants, you know, you've sort of made the hybrid. You just, someone's just facilitating that pollination to go down. Do you think there's any difference there between white labeling or do you think that like it's more like what I described where it's like, the person who does all the selection and comes up with the plan, like they're the one who's made it, even if they didn't physically facilitate the pollen hitting the female. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a difference. I mean, the selection is the whole art of the whole thing. I mean, as long as you keep the plants healthy and, you know, facilitate the pollen to the, to the female and, and, you know, do the basic, the basic grow, the basic flower of it. It's it, the rest of the work is done. The hardest the most difficult, the most challenging part is the selection of the male and, and the isolation of whatever female you're going to use and, and lining up that, you know, it's kind of like drawing out a map of, of what you think is, is going to happen. And the other person is just driving the car from point A to point B, you know, um, it's definitely some different type of white labeling. It's definitely kind of white labeling at the same time though. So I guess it's like one in the same, but different. Mm, yeah i get you it's definitely a, a bit of a, a quagmire of like specifics isn't it it's sort of you got to wade your way through it yeah absolutely okay so i mean as a little bit of a, a change of pace um i would love to ask you about testing and this is a, an interesting topic because i truly feel there's no wrong answer here and I guess if you look at the spectrum of testing, you know, in the past, there was this expectation that absolutely everything can very thoroughly tested. But as time's gone by, I've had many guests on the show who echo this sentiment that if you were to do things like the way we did it in the old school days, and you, you, you know, you're doing these really vigorous testings on everything, you sort of are not going to be able to keep up with the market, you know, by the time something's actually ready to go to market, because you've done your all the testing the way people want, you know, the market sort of moved on a little bit. And then you look at the other end of the spectrum and you've got guys like Masonic, who I, I really like Masonic. And, um, you know, he says, no, I don't test any of my stuff. And I'm very upfront about that. I will tell you this pack is $50 because it's not tested. But like, you know, it's 50 bucks. Like, uh, I guess I'm wondering, where do you stand on that? Do you feel one side is more correct than the other? Do you feel like it's just a distribution and it's like just a, as Masonic says, it's just about being honest. It doesn't really matter. Where do you sit on that one? Yeah, I don't think there's a right or wrong as long as you're transparent about it. I mean, I think if, you know, if he, like you said, uh, Masonic or whatever, uh, if he's telling people, hey, look, these are not tested seeds, buy them at your own discretion, they're, they're 50 bucks or whatever. And people can wrap their head around like, oh, I'm just going to spend 50 bucks and I'm going to see what comes of it. Then, you know, that, that cool. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what somebody, the direction somebody wants to do with their breeding project. Um, I think that some price tags when you start to get more expensive certain things are expected i think when you start getting into the multi hundred dollar price tags i think that line should be worked i think that seeds should be somewhat exclusive i believe they should be tested i think that you know you should know what you're getting if you're spending 200 plus dollars um and i think yeah if you're going to offer some cheap stuff and you know make it available to anybody, then, you know, just disclose that you didn't do any testing on it. And, and that's cool too. You know, I think if you, I think if you try to sell seeds that are crazy expensive and you don't test, you just kind of drop them and you don't tell anybody, I think that's kind of a dick move. And on the topic of testing, you know, what sort of a protocol, if any, do you have for figuring out if you like a strain, you know, in the past, 
we had Bodhi on and he was like, when I make a new strain, I, I just pop 10 seeds. Like I try to emulate the average consumer experience. And if I don't find anything nice, then I think maybe I shouldn't release this one. You know, I don't want someone to have that experience. What's your thoughts? Is there a certain number of seeds you like to go through or is it a bit more like what Bodhi said? What do you do? So with some of the past lines, I've made so many crosses and sometimes space is restricted. Um, it depends on how what I'm trying to release, what you know, what my goal is. If I if I got ten different genetics, I'm trying to drop, um, then I'll do something like you know a ten or a twelve seed or something like that. It's something that you know the average consumer would purchase a pack and, and pop a pack and see what comes of it. Um, sometimes you're not allowing yourself to see the full expression. So if I can pop more, I'll pop more. But I like the I like the Bodhi approach. I think that's cool, man. I like. You know, you're emulating what uh, what the people getting the seeds are going to kind of see. And I think if you have four to six good females that you're kind of looking at and there's no issues with those, then I think you should be all right. Sometimes it is cool, though, to see a bigger pool and, and kind of get an idea of kind of more rare things that will pop up. Some people want to see that. They say, you know what's the, what's the most common, you know, pheno that you're seeing, or, or did you see any that kind of stood out? And, you know, some people want a little bit more, um, information, but yeah, I think his approach is cool, man. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. I like that too. So I'd love to ask you, I haven't asked you already. What style of growing do you utilize? Um, so we do a lot of mix spectrum. We do, We've been doing a lot of LED type stuff lately. Um, I use a lot of screens. Um, I used to do everything hand watered, um, soil. I switched over to cocoa. Um, I use irrigation systems now because I have too many plants to tend to and take care of to kind of hand water and do everything on my own. Um, when I'm doing testing, I like to not pop plants. I like to just kind of stake them and, and kind of see what they do naturally on their own. Um, kind of see what kind of natural structures come out of them and stuff like that. Um, when I'm doing more of a grow for flower yields, um, I like my canopies to be even and I'll top them and kind of get a nice scrog kind of thing going. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And do you have a preferred medium, a preferred nutrient source, anything like that? Uh, yeah, like I, I've been sticking to cocoa lately because I had so many batches of, of soil that were just contaminated. You know, a lot of these supply stores out here will just like kind of like leave all their soil sitting outside and in the summer, the winter months or something and just you'll get gnats or, you, you know, they'll come with all this stuff. So I've been kind of like staying with like... Uh, HPCC, um, just kind of running cocoa mix, you know, and I haven't had any issues with that. Um, switched over to a um, couple different nutrient companies. And um, I think once you're just dealing with salts, you're dealing with salts and um, Athena has been a product that I've been utilizing over the past four or five months and yielding great results. Um, we do terpene profile testing and we do lab testing and, and we're actually getting better numbers using Athena than, um, the cocoa line that we were using before. Um, I use Aptis for a while. Aptis was good. I liked Aptis, um, too many parts and, couldn't use it in irrigation systems. So that kind of uh, forced my hand um, to steer away from that. But uh, when I was hand watering, I just did really well. Um, but yeah, the Athena line's good. It's really clean, great results. Um, I recommend it to anybody that's uh, looking for ease and solid results. Love it. Nice and simple. Always good to hear. So, 
I wanted to ask you, what's your advice for anyone who's in the industry who might be a little bit jaded with the state of things? You know, I personally feel like there's never been a better time to get involved in cannabis, but I do talk to a lot of guys who were probably um, pretty heavily involved in the scene back in the 215 days, you know, back the sort of golden years when, you know, pounds were 4K plus sort of stuff. Uh, what's your advice for people who feel like it's all gone wrong and, you know, they don't really see a pathway forward? Um, I mean, if you're around back when pounds were, you know, I've been around and pounds were $6,400, you know? So, I mean, everything changes. Um, supply and demand, higher supply. Demand probably hasn't gone down. If anything, it's it's gone up. But, uh, I mean, to, to compare when, you know, you had to actually – go out and look for weed compared to um, driving down the street and just buying it. Of course, prices are going to fucking come down and fluctuate. But if your passion's in cannabis and you believe that you can produce a good product and unique product, then I don't see why anything should be dictated otherwise than you just get involved and just kind of like, you know, master your craft and do the best you can. Um, the people always appreciate quality regardless doesn't matter how much demand or how much supply there is, they're always going to seek the best flower, the unique flower, something else that people don't have. So I wouldn't let the current state of the market dictate whether you are going to be involved in it or not. It's, you know, let the passion kind of steer you in the right direction and, and figure out your path and blaze your own trail. Yeah, I like that. That's awesome. We've got a few fan submitted questions before we get to the the final five quick fire ones. And the first one I wanted to ask you is, can you tell us a little bit about the hash burger? Sure. Uh, great yielder. Um, very burger esque. <laughs> the GMO definitely dominated in that. Um, you have to like hashy strains. And basically, you have to be okay with the GMO profile. It's just, it was so dominant in that cross. It was just, uh, it was basically like running a triple burger or a double burger. It was just, it was just straight GMO most of the time. Um, so if that's your bag of tea, then yeah, it's, it's definitely for you. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And what strain would you recommend for any listeners who want to run some of your genetics, but they're thinking, look, I do produce flour commercially, you know, not necessarily in a facility, but like, you know, I, I make my income from this. So strain does need to lend itself a bit to that, you know, maybe a little better yielding, some good turps, maybe easier to grow. Anything jump to mind from your range that might fit the bill for someone who's keen to run your stuff, but it just needs to be a little more commercially viable? Yeah, I mean, it's the cool thing about most almost every skunk house strain is that is it does yield and it does have bag appeal and it does have nose. So any of the genetic lines that I've developed um, has a pheno in there that is for a commercial grower or any circumstance that, you know, somebody's going to select, you know, any pheno from any pack. Um, there's hash yielders, there's, there's, you know, flower yielders there's everything because it's it's most of it has gmo spliced in it and it just it'll just yield like a beast you know so um the burger lines especially so stick to those um the og lines yield very well but they don't yield as much as the gmo lines the burger lines so i would definitely say sticking to some of the Donny crosses um, even the modified banana crosses yield super well and can, you know, completely be viable in commercial settings. Um, yeah, I mean, there's really not a bad option. I guess it just depends on what kind of turf profile you're looking for and, and there's something available in almost every of them. Yeah, that's beautiful to hear that there's so many options. And another fan submitted question we got is, do we ever have any chance of seeing maybe any s1s of your keepers absolutely um i want to do a whole s1 line i just i've had a couple projects that have just kind of taken front seat to it so um that's kind of gotten bumped back i've done a bunch of 
small S1 work just to see what is and what isn't viable. And I've gotten great, you know, results. They've yielded amazing plants. So there is going to be a bunch of S1 stuff. There's also going to be clone drops, uh, breeder cut clone drops that are going to be available here in Michigan um, for people that maybe don't even want to um, pop seed and they just want um, keeper genetics off the bat. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I got a bunch of stuff in the works. I'm just trying to make, you know, things possible for anybody in any circumstance. Beautiful. There's something for everyone. I like that. I like that. So what are the plans for Skunk House or, you know, Skunk Master Flex more generally in the future? Have you got any projects you're keen to start or any long-term visions? Yeah. I mean, right now we're doing the uh, Josh D collab one. Really, really, really psyched on that. Um, just as an OG lover, it's my favorite. It's, it's the end all be all for me. And to work with somebody like Josh, that's such an OG vet, you know, helped kind of like just catapult the OG and, and bring it to the masses. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a dream collab for me. You know, he's, he's a great guy. Really looking forward to that one. Um, there's a few other people that I'm in the works of, of negotiating collab work with that I'm really, really excited about um, if they go through. Um, always going to keep running and working on the Larry line. That's just a, a a fan favorite um the burger lines are not going anywhere there's always room to expand on those and, and bring in different genetics to kind of outcross and, and work and see what comes of that so lots lots in the works for skunk house and in in over the next couple of years not planning on going anywhere and gonna keep things still with the same idea concept i've always had which is like only make a cross once the people that actually get it, like let them have something that's really unique and let them do their selections and kind of let them have that, you know, um, exclusivity is very important. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. So a question we love to ask all our guests, what are the rarest seeds in your vault or the seeds that you're most excited to pop? I do have some original, can be GSC where the GMO came from seeds left. Um, a small little pile of them. Those are everybody's like pop those, pop those. Um, man, I got some Northern lights crosses that I got from uh, a guy that made some uh, out of New York. Um, Northern lights seven cross with like this IBL Northern light that he did. Um, talking about what we did earlier with the whole bringing back old school stuff. Um, those have been kind of like burning a hole in my fridge. <laughs> um, I have some, I have some, some AK seeds. I don't know if they're even viable anymore, but original packaging AK seeds from like 97 or something. Um, been just dying to pop those. Um, a bunch of older stuff, man, that's just been sitting there that I'm like, I, I like, I'm afraid to pop it because if they don't pop, I'm just going to be so devastated. So I've just like kept putting them off, which is like the dumbest thing I can do. But yeah, it's uh, the seed vault is just so extensive, man. It's just I got to find time and dedicate space to it. And it's just one of those things you don't want to mess up because they're so old and or you're not going to get them again. Yeah, totally. Totally. I can relate to that concern with the seeds. Okay. So. On to our final five questions. Uh, the first one, it's a, a new one that we've been doing recently. If you had to restart your seed company with just one packet of your seeds, presumably to find a male, but you know, you might also pick a, a femme pack and find a female and want to go from there. What pack would you pick? Uh, this is seeds that I've released or in my collection? Uh, seeds that you've made. Okay, so I've never released them, but yeah, I would probably just use the straight Larry uh, Backcross F8 or F9 or F10 and, and start a line from that. It's uh, you could pick them up and put 20, 30 of them into water and, and just find gold and work a whole line with it. And it's easy peasy, like it's no, no difficulty at all in it. Perfect, perfect. I love that. So, next one is, what's the single most memorable or impactful experience you've had with cannabis? Uh, getting arrested. 
<laughs> easily uh hands down um yeah uh just realizing how fast like for something that you love so much how it can just mess your whole life up and how stupid it is that it's that illegal and um just it makes me realize all the people that were before us and kind of paved the way and it, it just it, it really levels me out and grounds me that um, people did so much for legalization and, and allowed us to be in the state that we're in right now. It's just that, that one act of just going through years of, of courts and all that stuff, just for, just for something stupid, like having flowers. It's outrageous, man. But yeah, it's, uh, that's probably the most impactful thing with cannabis that, uh, that I've had to Go for it. It's a good answer. I don't think anyone can deny that. So uh, <laughs> the next question would be, what's a strain that everyone around you was hyping up? You were really excited to try it and then finally did and you were like, oh, is that it? Um, I would say, is this over like the whole duration of just working with cannabis or just yeah. recently? Yeah, yeah, ever. Okay. Um. That's a tough one because there's been some really hyped up stuff that I've really gotten a hold of and really didn't. Hmm. That is a tough question, my man. <laughs> <laughs> um, like from like things from like just, you know, like not to pick on Purple Punch because I actually enjoy Purple Punch, but like um, people were talking about how like amazing it was. And then you smoke and you're like, I, I, I get it for flavor, but it just it doesn't have some kind of wrecking devastating high and especially coming off the era of like og kushes and chems where like you know these things hit you're expecting this fruity tropical bomb of just pure insane high and not really quite getting there um a lot of the gelatos i've been kind of disappointed with i didn't really think they were that great um yeah, it's hard to it's hard to pinpoint one genetic. I'm like kind of dumbfounded right now. I can't think of one that I've just been completely like just in awe of how people even enjoy it. But um yeah, one of these friggin' designer ones that have came out recently and just I don't know, there's a lot of like boring Turk. I'd say any of the boring Turk ones that just don't really do it for you on the high or anything. It's just uh, you know, you expect more from the people these days with all these options they have <laughs> <laughs> there you go there you go so next one we have is we're gonna drop you off on a desert island presumably you can grow three strains for the rest of time what three are you gonna take with you uh og kush number one not any specific one i'd say just an og kush the original the larry any of them any of that category would work for me um a chem either the chem four or the chem D um, and possibly a Bubba Kush, man, probably the original one. Um, those are just like, if I could just, as long as I have jars of those, I'm good. like one of the three of those will always do it for me. Um, they're desert Island strain for sure. Um, there's a couple close competitors. It's like maybe the Urkel. Sometimes the Urkel can, the Urkel is weird, man. It's like, sometimes it can almost be too much. <laughs> like, the real Urkel is like devastatingly, crushingly high. Like it's just, it's strong. And I don't know if I want to go to bed all the time, maybe that one, but, um, I could eliminate it down to the number one and it just being OG Kush. That would be my, my desert Island strain, single desert Island strain. Yeah. Good pick. Good pick. So we're going to turn the tables now. Uh, you're going to drop someone else off on the desert Island, someone you're not particularly fond of what three strains you're going to leave them. Oh man, uh, Temple Haze from from Bodhi. So they just fucking wig out and have a terrible time. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, that would that would be terrible. Some people, I'm sure, love that shit, and it's just not for me. Um, I'm not a Green Crack fan. I'd give them some Green Crack. Green Crack never did it for me. Um, I'd give them the. The skunk, the sweet skunk, that's what I would do to him. That'd be a terrible thing to do to somebody. All the weed you can smoke is just sweet skunk. What a terrible, <laughs> what a terrible, terrible life. Um, 
Yeah, that's probably, dude, that'd probably be sweet skunk or something, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, our final question for the interview today. I've got a time machine for you. You can go back anywhere to any time, any period, presumably to collect some seeds or maybe even a cutting. Where are you going to go? What are you going to collect? I'm going to go to like, I'm going to go to like Amsterdam or like Europe and it's going to be like the mid to later 90s and I'm going to get like some old Sensi stock and it's going to be, shit, I don't even know. I don't even know what it would be. Maybe some of their earlier skunk work. Some of it, I feel like some of, some of that stuff has just been used, whether it's been admitted or not, in so many crosses and so much of the foundation of what we know as cannabis now that it's like ridiculous. You know, it was just such stabilized work and just maybe if it wasn't the most de devastating high, it was just, it was such an important part for cannabis genetically that it would probably be something like that era. Yeah, that's a that's a good pick. There were some killers around there for sure. So I think that just about brings us to the end of it for this one today. Were there any comments or shout outs you wanted to make? Uh, yeah, all my guys, man. Uh, shout out to ProGrow, my team. Uh, shout out to shout out to Lance, my homeboy, helping me uh, do the skunk house thing. Uh, Josh D. Um, all my friends here in Michigan, um, just like amazing cultivators. Shout out to uh, Chris over at Ghost Budster Farms. He's really helped me uh, in the in the in the legal market, kind of uh, rub shoulders with people and kind of put me in positions where um, I'm able to meet cool people. Um, shout out to you for having me on the uh, the show, man. Um, I had a great time. Man, you are too kind. So, you know, again, a massive, massive thank you. The head honcho of Skunk House Genetics, finder of the GMO, creator of the Donny Burger, the Double Burger, Mike Larry, so much more. Massive thank you to Skunk Master Flex for coming on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. Anytime, man. Reach out. And there you have it, friends. Shout out to Skunk Master Flex for taking the time to stop by today. A shout out to you for making it to the end. As always, we want to give a massive shout out to our sponsors. If you want to help support the show, support our sponsors. CT now, number one seed bank in the industry. You know them, you love them. All the best breeders. The hottest drops, guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. Why delay, guys? I promise you will be stoked if you get some seeds from them. They only stock the best in the game. Likewise, a massive shout out to our friends at Pulse Sensors, all the best and latest sensors in the game, including their new Pulse Hub, which integrates all of their units together to ensure that your operation is on point, producing bigger yields, better terps, higher potency. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation, Pulse are here to help you guys. Get serious, get a Pulse. Further shout out to Copa, the number one leaders in sustainable biocontrol solutions for pests and disease. If you're battling spider mites, please check out the Spidex Vital sachets. I can't tell you how annoying it is to have to spread carrier material in your garden just to get the predators out. These new sachets circumvent that. Just hang the sachets in your crop, let the personalist walk out, do the work for you. Trust me guys, you won't look back. If you give it one go, you will see the quality, you will be converted. A massive shout out to Copert. We appreciate your support so much. These guys are industry leaders. Check them out. Huge shout out to our friends at Organics Alive, number one for powdered organic fertilizers. If you're thinking about giving organics a go, get on board. Their products make it so easy. Whether you're in veg, transition, or bloom, they've got products that make it easy to dip your toes in the water. Likewise, if you're a seasoned veteran of organics, I promise their products will help take your next crop to a whole new level. Massive shout out to Organics Alive. They have some of the best products on the market. Really fast release because they're small particle size. You will not go wrong with Organics Alive hit them up massive shout out and thank you finally a big shout out to our friends at Dynavap just a week or two ago they came out with some new models 
the Titanium M Series in two different colors. You can get yourself the Nebulum or the Quantium. I've been rocking the Nebulum. I love it, guys. Please give it a go. If you've ever tried a vape and felt like it didn't hit the way you were looking for it, these ones will. Truly a game changer based out of the US, owned in the US. Dynavap, truly one of the best vape companies on the market. I really, really love their products and we are super appreciative of their support. Massive shout out to Dynavap. Last but not least, massive shout out to the Patreon gang. Thank you so much for your support. If you want to help ensure the show continues to happen, please consider checking out patreon.com forward slash the podcast. You will get early access to upcoming episodes, unheard exclusive interviews, and you go in the running to win a whole range of swag each month. We give away genetics, cannabis artwork, a whole range of awesome products, all while ensuring the show continues to happen. Again, a massive shout out to the Patreon gang. We love you so, so, so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And that's about it for this one, my friends. I will catch you for the next one. Thanks so much for hanging out. Heavy days. Signing off from the Upside Down Library. I'll see you.